I'm just <laughs> I'm still, I need one minute. Okay. Just give me one like minute. 30 seconds. Give us one minute. <laughs> We're now ready. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. This is Lisa Edinburgh, Chair of the Westboro School Committee. Today is Wednesday, November 9th, 2022. This meeting of the Westboro School Committee is called to order. Please stand if you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to notify everyone in the room with us tonight that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed by Westboro TV. School committee meetings are available for remote viewing or listening on Westboro TV's government channels, Verizon 28 and Charter 192, and online on the Westboro TV YouTube channel. Thank you to Westboro TV for covering the broadcast this evening. We have with us tonight Assistant uh, Superintendent Amber Bach, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Daniel Mayer, Director of Finance and Administration David Gordon, Vice Chair of the Westboro School Committee Steve Durrett, School committee members, Raghu Nandan, Kristen Vincent, and Stephen Batchelor. Our student representative, Aratrika Ghosh. Recording secretary, Jen Benton. And we have staff from Westboro TV here. And I'd like to personally welcome everyone sitting in front of us and those watching from home. Our agenda for this evening is as follows. We'll begin with an approval of minutes from October 6th, 2022 regular session meeting and October 17th town meeting session meeting. Then hear from Amber Bach with the superintendent's report, followed by the assistant superintendent's report. Then we'll hear from the director of finance and administration, his report, continuing the meeting with the school committee member reports, followed by the building project updates. We'll then uh, potentially hear from some citizens during citizens' requests. Then um, we'll uh, be walked through the Metro West Health Survey data report followed by an update of the Assabet Valley Collaborative Quarterly Report. We'll then move on to a review um, and from a, an actual request for approval of three DECA Distribution Education, Distributive Education Clubs of America overnight field trips, followed by an acceptance of an a anonymous $10,000 donation to the borough program. And thereafter, we'll hear from Dr. Daniel Mayer with the MCAS Performance Report and then continue with a walkthrough of not just one, but budget <laughs> presentations number one and then number two. Such an advantageous intro. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we'll enter into an executive session and then adjourn for this evening. So we'll begin with an approval of minutes. Um, actually, uh, do we have an approval of motion to approve the amended minutes from October 6, 2022 regular session? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Um, I'm just going to mention under uh, that meeting, under capital planning, Mr. Ferguson said the Armstrong gym roof repair had been moved to FY23 and will then will be accomplished in-house. That piece of the sentence should read, the Armstrong gym barrel roof's leak repair will be accomplished in-house with FY26 for the Armstrong full roof repair, comma, and then the rest of the sentence is correct. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. That's a five to zero vote, five being present. And we'll move right along to, uh, oh, is there something else? Oh, yes. yes. Other is there a motion to approve the minutes from the October 17th town meeting session meeting? So moved. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor? I abstain. Yep, four to zero, one abstained, uh, five being present. And we'll move over to the superintendent's report. 
Amber? Thank you very much. I, I think it's um, always fun to be back in our old stomping ground of the main hall here for our meeting. Um, the other hall, they were having a problem with the camera, so it was good to be able to shift over here tonight. So it's been a busy week. There's so much going on. I think as we move out to fall into the holiday season, you see the concerts also pick up. Um, I had the uh, pleasure this week of going to the MASC conference, which is the Mass Association of School Committee Conferences, with several of our members here on the board and attend a variety of very um, inspiring workshops, a couple that really resonated with me that I thought were very good, gave me time to do some uh, work and discussion with colleagues and was just a really an enjoyable uh, conference. From there, I had the opportunity to also want to give a shout out to the Senior Center for their annual holiday fair. Um, it's an annual event for them. If you haven't been, I encourage you to make time to go in the future. It's always a very enjoyable event. It's an annual fundraiser for them, but more importantly, it's a community event. I had the pleasure of sitting and eating lunch with a veteran and talking with him about the upcoming Veterans Day, as well as just um, events in Westboro and life in general, and saw lots of uh, friends and people I haven't seen in a while. It was just a really enjoyable event. Um, and I had also um, a nice overlap with um, several of the members there. We've been working on coordinating, sharing one of our Ranger vans with the Senior Center. They have two vans that run for the Senior Center, and they both, one needed repairs and wanted um, also needed a repair. So they were really feeling out of cycle. We were able to collaborate and step in. I want to give a shout out to the high school and to Johanna DiCarlo and people for modifying how we use those vans and manage the calendar so that we were able to step up and rotate a van to them for the use, uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks working together with it going back and forth. So that's been a very nice collaboration. Again, a sharing of community resources and when we reach out to each other, we're able to get a lot done. Um, similarly, as I was saying prior to the start, it looked like the Highlands was having trouble getting people to voting because one of their drivers was sick and the senior sandler was able to come over and help them and we sent over a driver as well and they had been able to already take care of it. So again, I think it's a community where collaboration and reaching out gets responses and things happening and, and the public schools are an active part of, of all of that. I then had some opportunity to just enjoy um, what becomes the completion of a successful fall season at the high school for sports. The boys have a very important game tomorrow as they progress. The girls fell to a heartbreaker uh, last week and I hear just literally played amazingly and it was really a sad loss but um, again a really vibrant season and the volleyball team again I have a special place in my heart for volleyball having played <laughs> myself so I enjoy both just the quality of the game and watching and the girls won last night and they're progressing into their third round of tournament play on Friday so that's very exciting so we have a couple people still in still in the fight there to continue their season um, the one acts took place overlapping on the same weekend along with voting and everything else. <laughs> High school was humming um, and the one acts were sold out and they're really a, a neat kind of in the round uh, theater approach that they've added to the one acts in the last couple of years and they're always innovating that program. It was really very successful and they, they did a super set of sold out events. Um, I do want to recognize that um, we got feedback, and I'm sure that the clerk, town's clerk did too, about just how busy it was at the high school during voting. And I think we got some complaints from people, both from students who felt it was hard to park and navigate with so many people around, and then seniors or people coming to vote feeling that it was congested. Um, I just want to acknowledge that we are always in very close collaboration with the town clerk's office, and we didn't anticipate as much traffic given that so many people have shifted to early voting and online voting or mail and ballots and yet there was still a very heavy turnout so it was all navigated successfully but it it's, was a surprise to people to feel that sense of busyness and I think uh, I just want to acknowledge it and I you know took point on talking to a couple of people that you know certainly came my way via email or conversation at the polls um, and I know Brian did and I'm sure that Wendy did as town clerk so I think it's important to acknowledge that we do a ton of really good collaboration to pull all of that off off. Um, centralizing the voting has many advantages for the clerk's office, um, but it does, you know, add congestion to the mm -hmm. intensity of the voting area. So things that we have to look at, I definitely think, and I think Daniel's made some adjustments as well, we probably will 
you know, at, at, certainly at the major election, it would be a no school day, and we look at and look at those kind of future adjustments. So I just wanted to be on record tonight just to say that I think it went really well, but it was busy. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, um, capital uh, planning is moving forward. The capital committee will be starting presentations next week, and Dave and Kelly uh, G. Capello and I have been invited over to do the presentation of the school's capital presentation. So we will be um, doing that, I think, on the 17th. So we'll have a budget presentation and a meeting on the 16th. I'll update you on my capital presentation slides and share them with you. You've certainly seen capital multiple times along the way here, but I'll update you on those before Dave and Kelly and I go across the street to be able to share those. That's a virtual meeting, so I'll also send the link to you and you can uh, you know, weigh in and watch uh, if you would like. So that process is moving forward as well. I want to note that Dave and I are in conversations about um, a, a technology estimate that came in that we didn't have rotated into capital, but really by capital process is a capital expenditure given the increases in costs we've seen. And we were looking at bundling um, together the cameras. You had asked uh, at the end of last year for the cost of finishing out security cameras at all of our buildings. And so John Green has completed that process and has those estimates. Um, looking at the cost of that, while it's not astronomical, it's, it's, if they're bundled together, it would be a more effective capital article. We would need to funnel that in and be requesting that to be looked at either this year or next year. So we have choices and we're trying to talk it through and look at the estimate as it came in. And so I just wanna um, make sure I'm being transparent with you that that will be, I'll update you again before I go to Capitol on the 16th regarding that. But that follows a request from you and from us as well to really look at making sure that we get all six buildings kind of at a place of, of equity around um, just hallway security and exterior mm -hmm. entrance. And again, if you think about, um, you know, last year, I think we had a Mill Pond student who exited the building and we were searching and trying to figure out where that student was. And when we have a camera system, we're much more adept at being able to move quickly to access by looking at the cameras where students exited and be able to kind of get a jump on those types of kind of security and personnel needs. So things to figure out with that. I just wanted to add that to my update tonight uh, and I'll keep you in the loop on that moving forward. That's my report for tonight. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel? Yeah, good evening. Um, I'm, my report's going to be folded in later tonight with the MCAS update that I'm going to give you and then also the enrollment um, part okay. of the budget. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. We'll look forward to hearing from it. Yeah. And Dave? Uh, I, uh, good evening. I <laughs> should like Daniel. Um, my report will flow into the, the uh, part two of the presentation later this evening. Big agenda items to look <laughs> forward to. <laughs> um, so we're going to move on to school committee member reports. Uh, we'll start with Aratrika. Um, I also attended the MASC conference, and it was actually a joint conference with. Pull your microphone a little. Sorry, they're a little more sensitive. It was <laughs> also a joint conference with Massachusetts student representatives, which is a coalition of all of the student representatives on school committees across the state um, who come together at these conferences to kind of um, advocate for certain things that they want to see passed on the state level. Obviously, there's limitations to certain things that we can do locally that the state needs to approve, so it's kind of the, our, the state voice for that. Um, I was happy to be elected chair for the state chapter and represent Westboro in that respect. And it was really nice to kind of go back and forth with different school committees and talk about kind of like what they're doing in their role as student reps. And there's a lot of student reps that are juniors or even sophomores and they, and they don't really know um, what they want to do with their role yet and things like that. So the organization's been really helpful in that respect. And there's also school committees across the state that even though it is required, they don't have a student representative yet. So part of the organization is also to make sure that we can help them in making sure that they have one when that's, po when that's possible. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the um, ELL student forum. So we conducted two more forums from, our, from the last school committee meeting I was on. Um, with ELL students, and I also met with Ms. Broomfield, who 
um, is the director of the ESL department. And what she's doing right now is kind of creating a foundation for our ESL um, department moving forward, which she wants to, I think she plans to have that up and going the beginning of next school year. But what I'm trying to do is making sure that these student forums and um, student voices are part of this process in creating all of these um, toolkits that we're having for teachers. So that might include things like having um, conversations with the ESL teachers as well as the students themselves. So far they've just been with me, but the teachers have expressed and Ms. Broomfield's expressed that they'd love to talk to the students as a part of the process as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is I had heard from around the school that people who were taking SATs or AP tests or things like that, um, and I've heard this last year and this year as well, that it's a bit difficult to concentrate with the lawnmower, so I'm trying to work with Ms. Ka Mr. Callahan to make sure that we can have the lawnmower not going during AP tests, ACT tests, SAT tests, midterms, and finals, just kind of a more, I guess, <laughs> pragmatic thing. Um, in terms of other updates, uh, yesterday during the election, students were able to help out. I was part of that class as well. It was Mr. Cullen's um, civics class with um, slitting the ballots and kind of just making sure that process runs faster. It was a really cool experience, and we were glad that we were able to help out and just make sure that our town was able to vote and get everything in. And we encouraged all of the people in our high school that were able to vote or of age and register to go out and vote as well during break or after school. So that was really nice. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to, and it's more of a question, I wasn't sure. Um, there's been talk around the school about construction um, on the second floor where the sprinklers had originally gone off. and. We had heard around school that there was going to be like classroom relocation, so I just wanted to kind of ask what's um, the update on that. Um, so at our last meeting, uh, Amber had done a, a, a brief update um, about that. Did you want to just give it yeah, a Yeah, no, it was a great input. I actually met with Mr. Callahan today, and he had a faculty <laughs> meeting uh, the day before with uh, Kelly G. Capello to talk through the process. Blue Sky sent in the repair company and coordination a group sent an in-depth set of um, cut sheets for just what they plan to do in each room and then also a, um, a layout to process. Um, they had a productive meeting. They wanted to start a course first with faculty and walk through the rotation of rooms and how they'll um, manage the displacement and then um, as a follow-up, I anticipate then that Mr. Callahan will go ahead and put out a general kind of school update to just kind of provide general information uh, so that people have a sense of how it will, you know, impact them. I think in general the student impact is is minimal in the sense that we set their room and they follow their schedule and it doesn't change. Teachers that are displaced, again, you're looking at teachers not being able to access their materials as easily, needing to pack out some items, and then also, you know, be prepared for those six weeks, although two of that really captures break, which is very helpful and why we kind of went for this time now. Um, and then um, a return when we come back in January to kind of normalcy with those spaces being back to, to what they need to be. Um, he'll put out an announcement, and I'll make sure I follow up with him to make sure it goes to all students as well. Um, he wanted to start with the impacted faculty, the ones that have to do the moves, iron out uh, items with them, which they did yesterday. We talked about it today, and then I think he has some other communications. So uh, I think, you know, it's important. I, I think if there's anything we know how to do in this district um, besides provide excellent teaching, it's manage construction and impacts to building projects. Because if you look at the trajectory of the last seven years, um, you know, four of our six buildings have had extensive impacts around construction and have managed it beautifully. So Armstrong, Hastings, Fales, Gibbons, and, you know, and you've got really only Mill Pond and the high school, which have had a respite um, <laughs> in that cycle. So uh, for me, coming in on a small uh, redo of a chunk of rooms in six yeah. weeks feels really comfortable. But I realize for people that have to face that, it feels like a big piece to unpack. So um, thank you. I'll make sure you get a good update. Thank you for asking. 
So, Steve, do you have something for this evening? Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, the uh, folks on CPAC who helped organize a, uh, an event on Sunday. We had a great time uh, getting to know one another, and I look forward to having more in the future. And special shout out to Erin Stevens, my wonderful co-chair uh, in CPAC. She uh, is a tireless worker. Thank you. That's great. Um, I don't have anything tonight. I don't have anything tonight, thanks. And um, S Steve Durrett, do you want to wait for your building update? Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to mention uh, a thank you to everyone who attended town meeting. I realize it's been a while since we've met, but there was town meeting on November, on October 17th and 18th, and those that supported the school and town articles. I'm grateful for their support. This is a time where your vote continues to matter. Our civic duty as Westboro citizens counts on this contribution to our democracy. This is no time to sit on the sidelines. And I'm also gonna give a quick update about Ma the Massachusetts Association of School Committee update that Kristen and I both, and uh, Steve Durrett, and our student representative mm -hmm. and our um, director of finance and administration, Dave and Amber all attended but I wanted to just mention the conference this year was really well done with a plethora of sessions that range from budget to transportation to equity based decision making. It was extremely well attended. Each session was full. And like last year, there was a presence and presentation from the Wapanoag tribal members reminding us all of ancestral connections and land we sit upon. Importantly, it was a great way for school committee members from across the state to connect and compare experiences and learn from one another. And finally, I wanted to mention that the Turkey Trot that benefits initiatives in the Westboro Public Schools will be held on Saturday, November 19th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Sign up. Sign up. It's not too late to register. WestboroTurkeyTrot.com. That's I'm Westboro OUGH. Yep, I'm registered. And evidently, I registered my husband. <laughs> you have to look that one up. <laughs> so that is all I have for this evening. Um, we're going to move on to building project updates from Steve. I guess I'm, I'm happy to be able to report what I'm going to tonight about the current status of failed school. Um, building punch list uh, items are generally complete except for the following. Geothermal final testing of the antifreeze percentage in the, uh, in the system is, uh, is being uh, confirmed and will be completed shortly if it isn't already. Uh, the installation of the owner's solar uh, production uh, meter transformers will allow will occur this Friday on November the 11th, when the utility grid and the solar production uh, system can be shut down. Um, this particular need is for the town to be able to know exactly what our own production has been, which feeds into not only the school's uh, electric needs but also uh, when there's excess into the, uh, <coughs> the uh, utility grid, which of course is um, uh, national grid, who's the utility in our area. And I'll speak to, to some more information about that in a minute. Um, the completion of the, uh, of the final uh, field uh, and, and grass seeding uh, has occurred. Um, the, uh, the lower ball field area is still got a lot of weeds and the contractor will be back in the spring to reseed it. Um, the installation of the, sage, the shade structure, which is in the vicinity of the um, playground area, uh, will occur uh, in de December and uh, uh, that will be the last major structure to be done on the site. Um, and there's this uh, strip of land uh, that was not treated as a result of the, the construction for the shade structure, which uh, by now may also be um, uh, loamed and seeded yeah, it is. to complete uh, generally that work. In, uh, in other information, Gilbane, the construction project manager, has now left the site. In Vertex, the owner's project manager is... Uh, uh, on-site presence will be intermittent until the project is complete. Uh, as far as cost goes for the project, the project uh, cost is uh, currently within budget with a small contingency left 
uh, for the project as we deal through uh, final accounting items. However, there are some claims that were made by the um, construction manager uh, that are still to be resolved. And um, depending upon the outcome of that, we will either have money left over or very little at all. A recent um, summary of the project uh, performance in terms of uh, green uh, reporting for the town uh, resulted in, in a compilation of information that I supplied to the, uh, to the green committee as well as to others in the town. And to summarize, the school uh, as was, that is the old fails, uh, consumed about 35,000 kilowatt hours a month in the past. And anybody that has a power bill knows how much money that cost the town. Um, since that time, since March of 2001, when the solar uh, panel system uh, became operational, um, we have received a credit under the net metering program uh, against uh, either future power bills for other schools or for other needs that we may have at fails of $47,000 uh, in, in uh, if you will, returned opportunity for, from the utility. That's up to this month. And at the same time, what that means is that we have uh, offset the, the previous demand that, was, that we were paying for. So the net of that is, uh, on a monthly basis, um, the, let's say the average energy consumed by the school was on the order of 35,000 kilowatt hours. And since then, we've uh, accrued a credit uh, over that period of time from March to now of $47,000 to the good. Um, so that also has another impact. And the other impact is that the geothermal system um, replaces what used to be natural gas-fired heating in the building. And uh, as a result of the fact that we are supplying our own electricity, the pumps that run the geothermal system in effect have a net cost to the town of zero. And so, and I can't remember, because we used to go through this every year, how much money we were paying for uh, natural gas and, and electricity, but it's a substantial amount of money every month. And as a result of our net zero plus design for fails, uh, it's making us money, which is one of the few things, except uh, the uh, borough <laughs> program that, that does help offset costs. Uh, and just a comment on the uh, MASE, uh, you know, uh, I am an appointed delegate um, of the school committee to vote on the resolutions that we talked about here um, perhaps a month ago. Uh, what was very interesting about it, there were six resolutions. Ultimately, they all passed, but there was a fair amount of wordsmithing uh, done in, in order to try to make the, those resolutions absolutely clear. Um, and as was... Um, mentioned earlier, these things are advice, if you will, to the, the general court or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and ultimately it's up to the general court as to whether or not they uh, would react to anything that the MASC offers. Um, it took us two and a half hours to do these six articles, of which only one was approved uh, outright, and all the rest required a significant amount of discussion. Um, the delegates, if you will, from the school committees of the Commonwealth, roughly 120, 130 people were there for this vote. And on other business, um, just a comment, uh, which others may have already, but um, as a result of town meeting and the vote for the uh, ADA as well as the HVAC work to go forward in terms of design, um, a, a number of us met with the um, designers of that project recently and um, uh, basically authorized under the new vote of the town meeting to begin the work so we can uh, com complete the design and go out to bid as soon as possible. Um, one of the things I did uh, in the one day I was there because I was trying to finish things I get paid for rather than things that are interesting like uh, MASE uh, was there was a presentation um, on electric buses and uh, Lisa was there as well. One of the things that was very surprising about that, uh, if you recall maybe four or five months ago, Raghu commented that on behalf of the school committee, the town submitted 
uh, an application to, to receive a grant for electric buses. Part of the discussion in this meeting was what happened to that program. Well, it was very interesting that, uh, that the government uh, put forward $10 billion to buy electric buses, pretty much bought 12,000 buses for various communities around the country. Um, I don't believe there was a grant in Massachusetts uh, out of that program, um, but the bottom line was is that the, in order to be considered for the grant, you had to be a town that had 20% uh, of your population below the poverty level uh, in order to receive the grant. Um, and as a result, uh, Worcester applied and did not achieve that goal either. So there is another cycle starting for which I can't remember what the dollar amount was, um, but this grant program um, was supplying on order of $375,000 per bus uh, with an additional 25000 to go with that um, for various maintenance issues, uh, paperwork, and, uh, and the installation of a, a charging station for each bus you would get. So there's a lot of discussion, or was a lot of discussion during this meeting to um, try to figure out how that program would fit in with Massachusetts. Uh, at least currently, it's my understanding that we can't have buses older than five years um, to, to service us, and if that was the case, then it would be a real tough sell, I would think, for a $400,000 bus. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's the background of, of that uh, particular story. And there was much more information, including uh, the fact that there will be another grant cycle out there pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. The next grant cycle is actually for spring of 2023, and it's a different type of cycle. It will include really any town looking for 25 to 30 to 50 buses. Yeah. So they're in that next round. And also to mention that the reason Worcester didn't receive the grant was because they didn't have 20% poverty level throughout the entire city of Worcester, meaning that there are certain sections of Worcester that do meet that criteria, but because it didn't meet the criteria throughout the entire city of Worcester. They were declined. The next round of funding will prevent that from happening. Be they recognize that a place like Worcester really uh, was an opportunity for it. And the other was that third party. Um, so if a bus company decides to get a, a grant, they can't use the buses in a town that doesn't have 20% <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> a poverty level. So you can't even uh, partner with a third party unless your town meets the criteria. Huh. Very interesting. So so there were a lot of details a that of uh, details. some of them they realized were not beneficial and they will probably weed those out in the next program. Um, but uh, to the extent that you might get, in effect, free buses from the government, they, they would definitely pay for themselves when you're thinking about diesel fuel being $6 a gallon. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so we'll keep it on our radar and see where we can go from there. Um, so our next on our agenda is citizens' requests. And um, it's two minutes before our agenda item. So I always like to make sure that when that time comes, if someone were to run right in, <laughs> that we would include them because, but for now, first we'll ask, are there any citizens here for citizens' requests? Seeing none, <laughs> we're going to move on to the next agenda item. But if someone runs in in the next minute, we'll come <laughs> back to this agenda item. It's only fair um, because we've also moved from across the street. And even though that was posted, someone might have ventured over there by accident. And uh, maybe we'll see them in the next couple minutes. So we'll move right along. We're on the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey data update. And here, Speaking about that is Roger Anderson and Kim Tynan. You want to give more intro? An important annual report, uh, biannual, like every two years we do it? By, when do we do it? Every two years. Every two well, years. it's biannual, except we missed one because yes. of COVID. So now we're going to go back to odd year. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> we have multiple years of data for people that are watching from home. And we use that data to get a perspective on um, benchmarks around insights to health around the overall youth community in the grades that they will speak about. 
Um, I want to just give a shout out to the fact that we're strong members of this um, process and known as a community really invested in learning about our students, getting data, and then partnering with the, uh, the group to make sure that we leverage the data. And I want to give a shout out to Roger and Kim as the two people who really champion um, drilling down into that and asking for um, you know, more analysis as needed so we can really get the most from it and use that to leverage successful work with students. And I'll turn it over to them to take us through it. Yeah, so thank you very much for letting us be here. We are cognizant of the fact that there is limited time and there's a lot in your meeting tonight, so we're gonna move fairly quickly. Um, even though we have, you know, a quarter million data points um, <laughs> that we are, you know, trying to sift through and the Metro West is doing a lot with us, we recognize time is tight. And we wanna thank um, Kara Presley, who also works really closely with us, our Director of Youth and Family Services, um, as someone who really helps us look at the data in, in, a, in a way that makes it work. What we'd like to do tonight is paint a picture um, of the youth of our community, right? And, and while this is data that comes to the schools working with a grant through the Metro West Healthcare Foundation, uh, the youth in our community are really owned by our community and supported by our community. And so while we bring it to the forefront as a school entity, we recognize that partnerships with other entities in our community and a lot of people have a lot of work that goes into developing who our young people grow up to be. So we just think it's really community-owned data. We're just the ones that get to share it. <laughs> uh, for tonight's presentation, uh, four really key pieces. We're gonna give you general info on the survey itself and how we've collected some data. We're gonna share with you some key pieces of our data, and we'll talk about the efforts that we have in place and have been doing for quite some time, as well as some of our future plans. So the survey, as you noted earlier, uh, this time it was on an odd year. We've been every other year on even years since 2006 up to 2018. Um, with COVID, we did not have the resources to ask our kids or our teachers or anyone else to do more. So they pushed back and now we have new data as of collected in November 2021. We also moved in November of 21 to a online format for the survey which is the first time, so instead of having 45,000 surveys that had to be you know, checked off by paper and there are only two companies left in the United States who would do it, now everything's online. Um, and while that questions are the same, we recognize that when you change a protocol in giving a survey, and our kids are some of the ones that have told us this, they're like, sure it's anonymous, but you've taught us, Mr. Anderson, that everything we do <laughs> online leaves a footprint. And, and they're right. So yeah. really, we've got to sort of look at it as potentially a little bit new as we move forward. And again, we'll get new data in 2023. Um, we received a highlight data report last spring, our full data packet, which is hundreds of pages um, in summer. And then we got new uh, subgroup reports within the last month. And we're very excited to share that with you. When we get the data, we get trends. So we know what has happened since 2006. We've been asking exactly the same questions in a number of areas. We get data on gender. We recognize that that may or may not include every single student, but that's the way we get the data, male and female. And then we have grade level data so that we see from seventh grade to eighth grade to ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, what type of patterns are emerging. Um, the new subgroup reports that we got, just to let you have a picture of that, um, we were one of the groups that was clamoring to the Metro West to give us reports that were more targeted. Mm -hmm. When they say 13% of our, our students are, are showing some habit or demonstrating some type of behavior, we want to know a little bit more. Uh, we want to know who they are. So the subgroups up there, whether it's race or ethnicity, how many years they've lived in the US, whether they have a disability, LGBTQ students. We now have the specific data on all those subgroups so that we can have really targeted interventions when we go to, you know, go to work on it. Um, we also are excited because many of those subgroup information is collected on things like MCAS. So we can begin now to compare data around our student well-being and how they're performing in subgroups. So we're kind of excited and, and thank goodness we don't have to do it by paper like we did <laughs> when I first started this. Um, and I talked about our targeted solution. So we do have some things that we're very proud of. We're not at a point with our data here, just to be clear, where we're panicking and, and ringing alarms. We've been doing a lot of work for a long time and we have in place many, many structures that are working very well. 
So a couple of those, one example is our substance use numbers are the best that they've ever been. You know, in general terms, um, almost every single indicator better at the high school, 100% of our indicators are down since 2018. And so we see progress there. Um, one other reminder, this is census data. So we didn't take 25 kids in one classroom and extrapolate what that would look like to 1,000. This is 1,044 students filled out the survey at Westboro High School. Gibbons at uh, 555. Over time, the data tends to be valid and reliable and without getting too much into the statistics of that. We know that things would be ping-ponging all over if they weren't, but they're very stable. And we definitely see correlations between actions taken and the data that is shared with us, but we can't unfortunately say we caused this substance <laughs> use data to go down. It's just not the way it works with this type of a survey. So here's an example of our substance use. Uh, the red line at the bottom is our cigarette use. Blue line is vapor products, which you saw jump there in 2018, but it has jumped back down. Alcohol, marijuana, this is at the high school. Everything is trending down. We feel really good about that. Our continued curriculum work on that goes well, as well as knowledge around the community. Um, interestingly here, and I brought this up, uh, vaping has been an issue that's been present in a lot of places. And I brought this particular graph up because you could see there was a spike in 2018, but it's gone back down. But the gray line at the top is the one that I think is really important to understand, and that's perceived risk of harm using vapor products. And in 2014, there was a lot of messaging and, and a lot of commercials and targeting of our students by companies to say that it's fine, as there's no harm in this whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Recently, we've been able to, through education efforts from us and from other places, to really get now 90% of our kids understand that these products are not good for us and the use is dropping significantly. Um, similarly, at Gibbons Middle School, we, we see you know, the, the substance use is very, very low and the perception of risk of harm, that dotted red line at the top mirrors what we saw at the high school. Even higher than 90% understand that these products are not good for them. Can, can I ask you a question? You can. Everything seems to be at peak in 2018. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Oh, I can't tell you the cause. <laughs> um, I, what we think is um, 2018 was prior to pandemic, um, and a lot of opportunity that people had to get their hands on some of those products was much higher. Some of the laws have changed, particularly around access to vaping products. There have been a number of lawsuits uh, toward Juul and other companies. Um, in our town, I think the access has gone down as well. Um, and we've continued to educate. Uh, that was sort of a pivotal moment. If you look at actually the 50-year history of cigarettes, it was condensed into about five years for vapor products, where companies were having doctors and other people advertise it. It was in magazines. It was everywhere. It was available. It looked cool. And then, um, you know, science caught up. Well, for vaping, it was, you can literally mirror it at, at a ten, 10 times less scale and see the same pattern. So, yeah. I can't answer to the other pieces, but for vaping, that's certainly one. Another piece where we see really strong things going on is our school attachment. Our kids feel safe at school, and in many, many cases, they feel connected at rates higher than the rest of the region. And when we talk about the region, this is the Metro West region that is supported by this grant. All these high schools, all these middle schools, all these communities from Wellesley, Wayland, Framingham, Hudson, Bellingham, quite a diverse group, but it includes some really other high-performing areas. And you can see we're on the left in the light-colored purple, and the region is in the dark-colored purple. And it's a little hard to read at the bottom, so I'll read a couple of them for you. This is about school climate. People of different culture and backgrounds, races, or ethnicities get along well. 84% here, 78 across the region. Students show respect for each other at this school. We're well above the regional norm, and this is Gibbons data. And when we see the high school data, some of the differences are even higher, that we are really having a place where all students are treated equally at this school. Our data is better than the region, and we feel really proud of that. Now, is our work done? Unless these numbers are all 100%, no, our work is not done. And some of the subgroup reports allow us a little bit of insight into, need, into who we need to engage with to have them feel more a part of our schools. Recognizing we had a couple areas that I shared there with you where we're doing really well, there are some areas that we need growth in and we need to have some targeted work. Mental health across the nation, 
across the state, across the region, and in our community is one that continues to be a challenge for our young people. While our connectedness is really good, there's a couple trends we want to share with you that give us a little bit of concern and make sure that we are addressing as a school and we'd like to invite people to address as a community. We still see that screen use has an impact on our students that is not necessarily always positive. And then we have those targeted subgroup reports. So here's mental health and suicidality at Gibbons. And this is not data we take lightly at all. Um, we see some trending up on this, especially in generalized anxiety. Now we've got a lot of things in place in our schools, including a universal mental health screening, so that when we see 20 to 30% of our students have anxiety or depression, we now know who they are and we can support them and provide them those opportunities. That's one example of the way we're approaching this. And, and by the way, this trend from 2018 to 21 is everywhere. It is everywhere, it's not just us. It's probably due to pandemic? I think the pandemic has a piece of it and the, the lost opportunity for people to interact and build skills, for sure. The pandemic was really hard on some of our subgroups, we've noticed. It should go down from now on. We right? are hoping <laughs> that it goes down. And certainly, um, you know, over the past few years, a number of the things that we could not do are now back. And we know those opportunities for connections with the, you know, the high school dance had 700 out of 1,000 students at it in the fall. It was absolutely magical. And it was not just one group of kids. It was every diverse possible group of kid you could find that you would never see at a dance 10 years ago <laughs> was there and, and having fun in a way that worked for them. It was, I was just amazing and I've not always been a huge proponent of dances but it was pretty special. <laughs> That's just my own issue. Uh, on this graph here, um, this is Gibbons Middle School. I just wanted to bring up the, the, the last column over. About 50% of our students spend three or more hours on screen time that is not for school or homework. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I see as I travel around the Westboro schools now compared to what we did a, a couple of years ago when we had to move to the screens. We had to because it was the only safe way to do so. Now screens down is much more common than it was over the past couple of years. And we're navigating how to maintain great technology skill development in our students and to have them have the face-to-face -face interactions that we think are really, really important and develop them as human beings. Here's one that we're looking at that's a little bit concerning. These are peer support. Um, and the line I want you to look at here is the green line at the bottom that sort of creeps up as we go. And that's just students identifying that they feel lonely. It makes perfect sense that this went up during the pandemic. But there was a trend of growth here prior to that that is on our radar. And we are working really hard in the schools to foster connections with every single student in a number of ways and provide opportunities for them to be engaged in a number of ways. So we want to keep our eye on that number as we move forward and see how some of the programs that we're implementing are going to work. Subgroup reports. I, being sort of a data nerd, was really excited about this because now we can really see if they say 20% of our student is doing this, well, who is it? Where's the subgroup? Who do we need to engage about this? Um, and here's three areas that the Metro West across the entire region has identified as groups that um, have significantly higher challenges in certain areas and their next grant cycle is going to target these. Um, we got the grant for the universal mental health screening that we're in the middle of a two-year grant. We're looking at very seriously some potential programming that we will look at for the next grant cycle that will be targeting these groups. Here's some demographic information for you that we learned through our subgroups. So regionally, across the entire region, all of those schools and all those communities we shared with you, LGBTQ students now make up over 20% of the population. Our data matches that. We're not significantly higher or lower, but that's a significant portion of our school population, both at Gibbons and the high school. And we know that LGBTQ students face significantly more challenges, particularly around mental health, and how they feel supported both in and out of school. So here's a targeted area that we now know is a big portion of what our numbers are around mental health. Also, Hispanic, Latino, Latino students face more challenges in similar ways, although we see some substance use differences here. So we know this may be an area where we need to do some targeted intervention. And interestingly enough, now uh, in Westboro, um, students when they go to their home, 
now go home, a quarter of our students go home where English is not the primary language that's spoken. That's not a, a good thing or a bad thing, it just is what the data is shared. And so when we engage with our students and when we engage with their families, we need to keep this in mind. So here's our LGBTQ subgroup. And the two sides of this graph look different because on the left with the two stars are areas that we see as challenges around mental health. So you can see that our LGBTQ students are twice as anxious and they make up a significant portion of what our data shows us and they struggle concentrating. On the other side are what we call protective factors. These are things that if students have this in place, they are less likely to have difficulty concentrating. They are less likely to show mental health. They are less likely to have substance use issues. And so our LGBTQ students have lower adult support at school and at home, even though it's not on the chart, and they don't feel like they belong as much. And so as we move forward and with some of our current training and our planning, we need to keep this in mind. For our Hispanic and Latino subgroup, again, the challenging behaviors on the left, trouble concentrating at school and, and vaping behaviors, this is an area we can now target, okay? And again, those protective factors, what can we do is, is our question for ourselves and for our community to have them feel like they're a part of the community at the same level that anybody else does. And then for our, for our girls, we have always talked to you, since 2006 I've stood here and said, you know, our girls report more mental health challenges than our boys do, but the gap is getting wider. And it's more significant. And so the Metro West, particularly in their grant cycle, really is looking for communities to do things for their girls. And so we're gonna try to look at, we have a couple programs I'll share with you in a minute, and some of the, and we're already doing a lot. We're doing a lot, you know, we have our infinity run, um, at Mill Pond, which is an example of that. Um, so just to keep you aware of, of what's going on and what's out have there. We, have we figured the root cause for that? A cost? A, co oh, a cause. cause. Oh, the cause. <laughs> well, I think there's a number of factors involved, and, and you know, I, I want to be careful that I don't just share my opinion on that. Um, we know that girls are more likely to report it than boys because there's some social norms around what's okay to say and what isn't okay to say. Um, we also know that um, in the pandemic, uh, over the past few years, um, if the way you look impacts the way you feel and all you did was stare at your face on the screen for three years and you were critical of yourself in that act, that that was a particularly challenging thing for many of our young girls to go through and do. Um, so it's, um, sorry, the mouse was moving. Uh, it's, it's okay. Um, yeah, it's just particularly challenging. I don't think we have all the causes of that, um, but we look at that all the time um, and try to figure it out. It's a, it's a great question. Um, we also know that social-emotional learning, which is kind of the base set of skills that all our students get, and the mental wellness work that we do is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, our students come to us having developed for a number of years, and we try to develop them across the time span of the, you know, 13 or more or a little bit less years that they spend with us. Um, and we know that that takes time. So some of our current and ongoing efforts, before I turn it over to Kim briefly, uh, to just share a couple more pieces with you. Our wellness and health curriculum continues to develop. We're based in the national standards. Our state standards are 22 years old. Um, so they're a little out of date, but there are new ones being um, brought up for review this coming spring, finally. Uh, we've been working on that. Our hiring practices are current, and we are engaging and bringing in people in our counseling staff that have skills that are directly related to the type of services that we need for our kids. Um, we have professional development for our staff in a variety of areas for you know, being aware of what our student body looks like and, and what they can do and how to get student support um, we have SEL education, which Kim will talk about for every single student in every single grade in a guaranteed curriculum. Um, we've done our universal screening for mental health where we can take the 20% of kids that we know are anxious and identify who they are and provide them with the opportunity for support. We have a number of collaborations and partnerships, whether it's with Youth and Family Services or Square One or other community groups or other school systems who are facing similar issues. Um, and we have a lot of things going on at our schools that are really working hard to bring our students in and develop those protective factors. We have a unity week coming up at the high school in a few weeks. The clubs are really robust at both Gibbons and the high school, and a lot of other school-wide efforts are, are in play for that. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Kim. 
We continue to be very proud of the work that our school counselors, our teachers, and our leadership have accomplished in developing the tiers of support specific to social emotional wellness. Um, we have these very th three <coughs> very clear tiers, universal screening, the social emotional direct instruction, the targeted support, as well as intensive support. Universal Design for Learning increases and optimizes teaching and learning for all students, which is our goal. So when we think about tier one and universal screening, why universal screening? As Roger said, we've been looking at this data from since 2006, really wondering about the students who are struggling. This provides us with the data and information in order to target those students and offer them the support if they choose to take us up on it. Um, we have successfully screened two grades last year and doubled our efforts this year in screening grades 7, 8, 9, and 11. Uh, we just finished screening grade 11 yesterday. Um, and those data are consistent with the Metro West data and we look forward to uh, presenting those data to you in the spring and provide you with more details around those data. Um, and just know, as Roger said earlier, we're not alarmed by this work. We um, feel like our students' performance, while, you know, is increasing in, in certain areas, we, have, we feel confident in our approach to addressing it, and we feel that these two data points are consistent with one another, which we think is really important. Social emotional learning is um, the instructional piece of tier one that we're providing to all students. And we are using um, curriculum from grades pre-K all the way to 12. Our pre-K pre students through grades five are using the second step curriculum. And grades six through 12 are using trails to wellness. That is explicit instruction provided for every single student, as Roger said, so we have this guaranteed access for all. In addition, social emotional learning is embedded in our classroom cultures, through our practices of our teachers, the practices of our leadership in all that they do in our school communities, and integration into content when, when applicable. The research around social emotional learning in our schools is continuing to grow um, in really demonstrating the effectiveness of student outcomes. In short term, um, we see improvements in academic achievement, and we um, also see more meaningful connections with educators and peers. That really gets at that protective factor that we want to increase for students, and so um, the social emotional learning curriculum helps to do that. Long term, we see increased ability to effectively manage stress, as well as increased college and career readiness, which is really important to us. As I mentioned, we see improvements in classroom and school community outcomes, with again, that protective factor there in the middle that I would highlight, improved teacher-student and student-teacher relationships. We know that kids learn best when they feel connected to their teachers, um, and so, you know, this social emotional learning curriculum helps to enhance that. This is some information that has been shared with you now for a number of years. I think Dr. Mayer shared it originally a few years back, and we continue to update it. Um, the World Economic Forum highlights that there are skills that they are looking for in our workforce. And so as we think about the skills that the workforce is looking for, 80% of them are social emotional skills. And so while right now we're primarily focused on our students' academic performance and success in school as well as, well as their well-being, this, this, this work is also going to help them be successful postgraduate and in life. So I think Kim encapsulated some of the work we're doing really well. Um, we've got some future plans that we want to share with you. Uh, the data will be available tomorrow. So the highlight reports, um, there's two highlight reports, one for Gibbons, one for Westboro High School. Those will be available on the westboroK12.org website tomorrow. Um, I've got those set to go. Um, one of the things we think is really important, and I want to put this on your radar, is that we think expanding our health offerings below grade eight is really important. We know the kids didn't walk into Gibbons and suddenly have all these behaviors. There's some things going on and some skills that can be developed prior to that. We've got the SEL in place. 
but some we're and we're looking at some creative ways to do that because we know the budget is tight as well um, and and finding ways in our elementary schools to have health education be explicit um, we are going to provide some opportunities for our community to engage through partnerships we also have some proactive programming going on um, the Metro West did, has done a great job providing me and other wellness directors with some um, sample types of forums that we can run where the data is shared and compared across community groups. So you'll hear from us in our development of that. Um, one of the things we're looking to get a grant for is something called the Chica Project. Um, and that is, a, uh, that is a program targeting Latina females. And interestingly enough, a former Westboro High School graduate is one of the leaders in that program. Um, so we've got to look at the logistics of that, but it really addresses two of the key subgroup areas, um, females and our Latino Hispanic population. Um, we continue to develop our curriculum in everything that we do and the offerings that we have. And Kim mentioned the universal design for learning model. That is a model our district has taken on um, and really taken a great study to this year. But it is a model designed to have all students' needs met through the classroom experience. And, and we think that's really important. So all the, all the members of Westboro Schools are doing that. Um, and so with that, um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. We know we moved really fast and didn't get to nearly all of the data that is there. However, hopefully we've been able to identify a few things and share with you some of the actions that we're going to take to the benefit of our students. Because we want to remember that our, our goal is to have all students be able to effectively access their own learning and then grow to become the kind of people who can go off into the community having been really well prepared here. Um, so we would love any questions, but we recognize time is tight. And also want to offer the opportunity, Kim and I, and certainly with Kara as well, are willing to meet with anyone who would like to along the way um, to discuss any pieces of the data that we have or thoughts and ideas. Arashrika? Yeah, I wanted to ask, so in the current and ongoing efforts, um, you had mentioned that hiring practices was part of it and that you're looking for like specific qualifications in the counseling department. So like, what are the qualifications specifically, like some of them that you were looking for? So in my understanding, you know, we've shifted a little bit. We've taken the tier one work, so that social emotional learning curriculum and pushed that out to everybody. Every teacher, everybody in the Westboro Public School owns that. So now the counselor's job shifts a little bit to that tier two intervention. So it's students who need to be a part of a group uh, to learn cognitive behavioral therapy skills or students who need some in individual intervention but not at the highest level. So we're now, as we, we've had a, quite a bit of turnover over the past few years in some of our counseling departments, we're looking for people with those skill sets, whereas maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we might have been looking for somebody to do the tier one work as a counselor. So I think it's a really good question that you asked. And, you know, it's not the only thing that they do, but it's a shift in the lens of how we hire people to meet the needs of what our students are presenting us with now. Did that answer your question? Yes. And just to follow up on that, is there, like, within the ongoing efforts, is there any efforts to um, reduce turnover within the counseling department? I know that, like, students, like, have multiple counselors. I've had multiple counselors throughout my time at the high school, and it can be kind of difficult sometimes. So. Without question. I think teacher retention and staff retention is, is certainly something that's on a lot of people's minds, not just in the educational world, but across the nation. Um, we see some difficult trends on that. Um, but yes, we are working very hard to make sure that all of the staff feel valued and want to be here and that there's clarity around what everyone's role is. So it's a very fair question. Other questions from the committee? I just want to say how exciting it is to hear what you've presented and know, having been through three of these reviews, to see that the work you've been doing is really correlated to all of the things that you're finding. And I've seen that work going through between social emotional learning, the beginning of universal design work. Um, we're seeing that three-legged tier that you, know, that you spoke of. Um, yeah, I thought that was the social emotional learning work, uh, the drivers, the support, the instruction. It's all happening. And I think some of that is so invisible to some of our families. but. Um, you've really been doing the great work that connects to all of this data. 
And um, as, as much as some of it is daunting, it's amazing to see that there are subgroups now and you're able to target some of the work and find grants specifically for that work and um, extraordinary. So kudos to all of you. It's been exceptional. And um, I just want to thank you and your teams and Kara Presley for your team at Westboro Youth and Family Services. The great support of the town and the school services together is really an extraordinary collaboration. Um, and especially, I want to thank the teachers who are really on the ground with our students, um, making all of this happen, and know that it's completely integrated into their curriculum much of the time. And so it's they who are doing incredible work. So no, you hit the nail right on the head, Lisa, yeah. in that everybody in the Westboro Public Schools, from the very top administration all the way down to every single person who interacts with our students in any way, is invested in their well-being. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. And, you know, hiring great people and finding ways to work hard to retain them and their investment in all of our students is really important. And we will continue to do the work. We appreciate all the support that you give. Well, thank you. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. We appreciate yeah, it. Thank you guys so much. Yes. I think so, one part to just kind of, as you connect the presentations you'll hear tonight, you're going to hear an enrollment report, you're going to hear an MCAS report, you're going to hear a budget report. All of those feed. Um, into understanding the kinds of students we have, I think we get very comfortable in a really exciting way talking about the fact that we are an incredibly high performing district and we are diverse and our kids are interesting and they are incredibly busy and there's just this wide array of amazing programming going on. But all of that has its complexities, and you listen to the underlying data about students that have 20% of our students across you know, a range of levels of complexity around anxiety and stress and worry and pressures and struggling with belonging. And we're trying to fold all of those needs into knowing them personally, connecting with them while diversifying and individualizing their curriculum and meeting their needs so that they can have a trajectory through their schooling with us that makes them prepared to move beyond us and their families into other levels of independence. And so I just think when we say, you know, good job to how it all fits together, it is really important to step back and realize the immense complexity of, um, you know, fewer and fewer resources of diverse connections that kids are connected to outside of school. Mm -hmm and more and more around isolation from real connection. And those payoffs are that the school ends up folding in to more complex needs to make sure that we're giving real connection. So it's just, schools are so complex, and I just think as you look at the other data around Daniel's MCAS presentation and the, the approach we're taking to class size, I think it's important you see the integration of those tonight when we start presenting. So thank you, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. No, it just shows you how much, how extraordinary it all is because it all fits together. And, you know, they are you know, at it all the time. Yeah. Really working on looking at the data and how to. And there's few yeah. departments where you have the integration of, you know, your wellness director and your your um, psychologists and your special educators and your counselors integrating at that high level is really uh, a reason why we're doing well. Well, we are going to move right along to the Assabet Valley Collaborative Quarterly Update. I, seem to, I often forget to tell people that um, everything that we see on our agenda, we have um, a, a heads up prior to the meeting. We see documents, we see memos, we see reports, we see slides. It's not like we're seeing this for the first time. So in that vein, um, the Assabet Valley Collaborative Quarterly Update, we have seen that update. Um, and so, Amber, do you want to say anything more about yeah, it? Yeah, I think you've captured it well. This is the annual report and record where I provide to you documents that you can review so you see the health and focus and planning of Aspen Valley Collaborative, of which we are a paying member. And when you're a member of a collaborative, you will participate in its organizational management. I'm the current chair of Aspen Valley Collaborative's board. Um, doing my stint of the cycle of support and this is the report that you can review at your leisure that gives you an update on the start of the programming through the fall they're currently uh, moving into you know the implementation of their budget and doing the work that they need to do um, I feel like the year is off to a good start we're currently doing goal setting I will let you review this on your own and it becomes record of your first report of the year 
Do um, we need to make an act? Uh, do we take action to say we've received the report? Um, the minutes remember. should reflect that the first uh, quarterly report, one of four, was received and um, acknowledged for your review. Okay. I acknowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Jen can put it in the minutes. Shall we? Shall okay. We, have, that? we yeah. have received the quarterly report. Um, that'd be great. Okay. So we're moving right along to a request for approval of three DECA overnight field trips. Amber, are you walking us through this? So I guess I am. I didn't get a chance to confer who was coming, oh. and I see that it's me. <laughs> um, so um, I think one of the things we really like is that the um, the DECA group, which is like the business collaborative and a team where they go and do um, a lot of their uh, trips where they're presenting their business uh, profiles, defending their um, their uh, projects and then receiving competition feedback. Um, they were very, very successful last year. Remember that group came and yeah. had had a great trip and then actually went to nationals and yeah. traveled to, where'd they go, Texas? I can't remember. They, they went to Georgia. Thank you. They traveled <laughs> to a trip and did some fundraising and were supported. So here they are again, jettisoning themselves into a series of plans for their trips. So the first one will be November 11th to 13th and they will be traveling to Washington DC where they're going to do a power trip which I love the name of that I want to go on a power trip <laughs> ultimate DECA power trip obviously people want to go when it's named that um, you can see that they will be um, 10 to 20 students 9 to 12 leaving after school and uh, attending the trip and then returning um, they have comments around what they'll be doing. Again, I think one of the things we do is frame trips well. We book and organize students' times. We keep them busy. We make sure by the time they get back to the hotel, they're very tired. They go to museums. They have outings. They enjoy working. And then they participate in the labs and the lab learning groups. Um, this is a really busy conference. And that would be their first outing. I'm going to do all of these, and you can receive them as a group. Um, you can see that they have their flight information attached and what their planned itinerary is. Next, then, they would be planning forward for their March trip. Again, similar group of students going to the State Career Development Conference. There's a lot of leadership work. This is really um, the kind of stuff that kids get a ton of benefits out of. A lot of times, if you look at our STUCO groups, our student council groups, they get to go down to a lot of leadership conferences. Those students tend to jettison into college and get themselves involved in a wide array of activities and move into leadership positions and participate. It's really nice to see this whole other academic layer of opportunity for students to get the same kind of leadership training. So I think very good news. You can see the size of their group has also increased, it kind of grown. So they would be traveling uh, again down to Boston for this one, which is nice because it's local. Their itinerary is attached. They'll be doing a whole bunch of leadership, self-paced conferences and information. And again, then finally, they will have an April trip where they would be attending the of going to Florida to the Orange County Convention Center for Career Development International Conference. Really quite ambitious set of plans, um, and you see industry validated competitive events, should be very cool. National standards competition for them there. So they're planning on being successful, as true business people do, um, <laughs> and that would be their trips. They will use the ratio of uh, chaperones that we typically do. It's either one to five or one to seven, depending upon um, you know, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, everything's organized. You can see the flights, the plans, and everything. So I would seek your approval on this. I'm very excited to see this group developing further. Uh, Steve, do you have a comment? Yeah, if you could go back to, I think, the second page of this. He's got to speak into the microphone. Oh, you got to speak into the microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. OK, third page, excuse me. Yep. Uh, I was interested to see that we're flying uh, to Boston from uh, DC, but I didn't see any of the itinerary as to how we got there. So. Um, it seems like the, one of those sheets is missing. I think it, that is connected to the, the trip as a whole, like from other places. 
when I was looking at it, I was like, oh, we don't fly to Boston for to Boston. So it was. We, we must fly from Boston. From to Boston someplace. to yeah. other places. I thought it was just a general. Oh, maybe those pages look like they're general yeah, to me. I think, yeah. about, yeah. right. I think the pages are in the wrong order. So if you yeah. flip them, then their itinerary Boston makes sense. The, yeah, uh, it starts. Yeah, DC. sorry, I apologize. Yeah. Yeah, and the only gripe I guess anybody will have is that they have to go to Newark to get here. Yeah, don't understand. tell me about Newark. We know that I hope terrible. the price is really low. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, um, that's the return my flight. Son refuses yeah. to fly through other Newark. flights on the other pitch. <laughs> um, all right, can so, I hand it back to you guys? I'll, yeah. move, I'll move the um, uh, acceptance of the of the trip information on behalf of the school board. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? I was going to mention that there are more than 3,200 high school DECA chapters that prepare these emerging leaders and entrepreneurs for college and careers. And Westboro High School is just one of mm -hmm. 3,200. It's really an impressive organization. Yeah. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. We have a 5 to 0 vote approving the three DECA overnight field trips. Congrats. Well, that's exciting. Okay, we're going to move right along, right on schedule, to accept a, an anonymous $10,000 donation to the borough program. So and we have received a joint memo. Um, Amber, did you want to say anything else I'll about that? I'll hand over to Dave. Of so, Dave, uh, thank you. I'm happy to, to read this. Um, um, the borough, as, as I think it's fair to say, everyone knows is um, kind of our beloved kid story. <laughs> adult program. Uh, it's extremely successful and in, in all its efforts, whether it's you know, sweet treats and just um, <laughs> the pursuit of um, kind of supporting students of, of that age demographic as they transition to life, things of that nature. So um, the borough received a anonymous donation. I'm actually just going to read it because I think Aaron LaPrade articulates it very well. So. Um, it says, I am pleased to report that the borough program has received a donation in the amount of $10,000 from a generous member of the Westboro community. This anonymous gift replenishes our student employee payroll fund, which was established by the same donor in 2020 in order to enable the scheduling and compensation of the borough program students for work in the sugar shack um, outside of the classroom hours. Excuse me. The ability, the ability to apply vocational skills learned in the school day in an authentic work environment is an important step to our students' vocational development and independence. The replenishment of this payroll fund sus sustains our ability to offer them a valuable opportunity as the Sugar Shack continues to grow toward profitability. And um, I think the action that I would request is that you as a school committee accept the donation, um, which Amber and I have um, internally accepted and <laughs> gra graciously, <laughs> as and graciously as appreciate. As <laughs> so anyone else who would like to comment? Okay, I just wanted to say we are enormously grateful as the school committee to receive your donation. My father used to say, and he still says, you don't give and expect something in return. And within that, he included non-recognition for giving, because giving is the return, is the gift for you as the giver. My perception of this anonymous donation is a person who recognizes this sentiment. Again, we are appreciative of your continued support of the borough program. I'm so glad you see its value and hope you see how your generosity helps this program prosper. We very much appreciate your donation and, and greatly accept it. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. Um, I'll make a motion. Make a motion to accept the ten thousand dollar anonymous donation to the borough program. Do we have a second? Second. Steve or Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone named Steve? <laughs> Jen can pick. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? We have a five to zero vote accepting that donation. Oh, that is great. We have had really viable employment opportunities developing for our students, our young adults who have been in the program, both beyond the program and then returning to work for us part time while they've secured other jobs and, and are working in the community and then coming back because our own workload has continued to increase and we're coming into the holiday season. So very, very good things happening on the ground there and it's just an exciting program. So thank you. Currently, I think there are I want to say 10, but I can get you a, a concrete count. I'm like, it, you know, 
I haven't like looked recently because they're also students are sometimes aging out of program and then students are coming in I think we're at 10 students but I'll find out um, there's often students there that are coming into work that have graduated so sometimes I'm missing the, the total um, but it's certainly getting to be a more and more vibrant and busy space in ways that's very exciting their corporate orders have really picked up so they're doing a lot of bulk packaging and delivery so exciting stuff so we're going to move right along on schedule to the MCAS results of 2022. Daniel Mayer, Dr. Daniel Mayer is going to walk us through this. Okay, good evening. This is a, quite a data-filled meeting. Mm -hmm. health, health data, MCAS data, <laughs> budget data. Um, so um, the MCAS results presentation, as you probably know at, uh, by this point, is sort of like a, an annual checkup if you, you know, it's an analogy to the way I look at it, to like when you go to the doctor's office, right, you check your cholesterol and <laughs> your blood pressure and, um, and you see how you're doing and you're trying to look whether you've got any issues um, that you need to be concerned about. And just like when you go for an annual checkup, um, you determine um, whether or not you're out of the range of normal or healthy and um, that's the purpose of this exercise as I see it, and I think you see it, and you know, at this level, talking about the whole district's data, um, the best way to give you a sense of, of uh, how we're doing is to benchmark ourselves against other communities as our range of like sort of normal. Like how, how are we doing with the communities that are performing at the level that um, we want to be performing at that we see as our competitors, I guess, not our competitors, our, <laughs> com you know, our, our compatriots, our, you know, <laughs> so, so um, uh, what I'm going to do for, you know, there'll be, there are a lot of data points, just like in, in the uh, presentation that, uh, that you heard from Roger and Kim, but I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because um, oh you don't want to, I think, go down deep unless there's an issue that <laughs> you have a question on. And so we've, I, we've yeah. seen it. It's just so the people at yes. home know, we have looked at this data and we've looked at these slides ahead of time. Yeah. I always forget to tell people that. that and, you know, and, and data is public. <laughs> it's and, available. Uh, it's available. The report will be made public to the community. And mm -hmm. so in any case, let me just you know, give you the overview of where we're headed here for the next couple of minutes is, oh my God. So first of all, the action of Amber's admiring the very adorable I'm, child. I know, cannot sorry, get I'm over like, how cute, cute that kid is. That kid. Yeah. <laughs> After all these years of doing this work, I'm still like, look so how cute, cute that kid is. Yeah. <laughs> um, who, who, like, I, I think that the, per, the person who took this picture, I did not take this picture, but, but when she saw it, she was like, I didn't realize I got my brain to grow poster. Right. In the back. Yeah, in the background. <laughs> That's amazing. Sort of perfectly <laughs> placed. Yes. Um, so the presentation, the, the outline of what I'm about to present is I want to give you an overview of our, who our benchmark communities are, how we pick them. Um, we always look at achievement scores and growth scores. They're, they tell us different things. They're both very useful. Um, then this year is the first year that we really have some sense of what the impact of COVID has had on the learning of our students. So I want to talk about that. Um, then Chuck, you know, run through some quick, fairly quickly, the a number of like 11 different slides that just have, like I said, check up kind of data, um, on ELA, math, and science. Those are the areas that the MCAS um, uh, measures. So, um, and then open it up to, for discussion. So first of all, benchmark, benchmark communities were selected several years ago in consultation uh, with uh, town um, officials, looking at not just the schools, but also police, fire, DPW, and how these towns were, um, these 15 towns were picked based on the criteria that the school had some criteria, the town had an other set of criteria, and, and we basically merged the two. Um, so we were looking in particular at towns that are similar to us already in terms of performance on MCAS, SAT, AP scores, 
um, the diversity of their student population and their size in terms of enrollment. So those were key, key criteria for our, um, for, from the school side. Um, and then on the town, you know, again, population, size of the town, and the income, um, per capita income in the town, the kind of service that is provided by like the, in terms of staffing ratio, the fire, the police, the library, um, the number of roads that need to be made, the miles of roads that need to be, be, be maintained and some financial benchmarks. So um, the, the communities I've already showed you and, and now what I wanna do is start to move into um, giving you some more information on the communities but and, and how they compare. But before I do that, let me just make sure you understand this definition of the difference between achievement scores and growth scores. So these are two different types of scores we get back with the MCAS. And the achievement score is the percent meeting or exceeding a certain standard on the test. So we're looking at there's like, uh, there's either uh, not meeting, approaching, um, it's, meeting or exceeding are the four categories and it's it's saying how did you com how did you do compared to uh, everyone else at meeting a set cut cut point like how, you know did you get um, high enough score to be in the exceeds category or the meets category that is different than the student growth score <coughs> in that student growth score is looking at how you perform relative to other students across the state who had the same prior academic performance as you. And the reason why the state came up with this measure is they recognize that there are, um, uh, you want to see the students who are not meeting the standard, how well they are growing, how we are making the progress we are making with them, and that's an important measure. And, part this measure was created because there was a recognition that there's some students that fall into the category of high needs um, that may come to school with certain um, limitations that they would start off behind on the MCAS and they may be in the um, low performing category but you want to see how well you're doing by them in terms of how much we're advancing them in terms of growth over, a year, over the years. So it shows you progress based again, uh, if you're in the category of you know, not meeting the standard and then you move up to meeting the standard, how many of those kiddos did we move up compared to other kids with the same profile in different um, communities, communities across the state? So um, I guess I actually already gave you this slide and talked it through. <laughs> Sorry. I, um, forgot I had it laid out here, but it's basically um, uh, the same thing that I just told you. So the, the before I actually get into the MCAS scores, I want to make sure you see how our community compares um, on this measure that they call high needs. The state uh, has a measure of high needs that consists of um, three different categories, special education students, uh, English as a second language students, EL students, and also uh, low income students. And so those three categories, when you see Westboro here at, is at 38%, or towards the top um, in terms of the percent high needs. You can break this down a little bit by, um, I mean, but we're not that far, far off. I mean, as you, with the benchmark communities, just to be clear, while we're at 38%, there's plenty of communities that are you know, in, in the 30s here, in the high 20s. And so that's the nature of the benchmarking. I mean, there are communities out there that we could have picked that have high test scores that have very, very low percent of high need students, much lower than we have, or vice versa, much, much higher percentages. So mm -hmm. there's, it's fairly tight in here. Um, so is that percent against the total? Uh, it's the percent of students within Westboro, 38%. Yeah. And so let me against just... Against what? Uh, against 38% of the students is high needs versus non-high needs. 
Yeah, against so, against so, so, so it's against ourselves. It's yeah. against yeah. ourselves. Yeah, okay. So, so we then we to break that down, needs, what's that? Is it we who determines which student is high need student? Or no, so let, let, me, let me break it down a little bit mm -hmm. for you here. So like the percent ELL is, the, is, is rolled up into that number. So we have 9% of our students are considered ELLs. Um, and that, that number is determined based on screening mechanism to, to ascertain English language skills. And um, so we basically, the whole state screens students for their English language skills, and if they fall in, if English is their second language, if they are receiving services, then, so we have 9% of our students who fall in that category. So then, is that the same test across the state? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's called the access test. <clears throat> and then there's the economically uh, disadvantaged students. And this is this number has changed over the year. It used to be like self-reported by parents, and, and and it was like free and reduced price lunch, as filled up forms that were filled out by the parents. But the state has data that they now provide us based on um, the demographics of our students, and, and so we have 16 percent of our students that would fall in the economically disadvantaged or low-income category. And so you can see where we fall here, again, relative to our peers. And then there's the special needs category, um, and we fall at 15% here. So you know, when you look across there, we're in the bottom third when it comes to special needs, we're in the top third when it comes to economically disadvantaged, we're in the top third when it comes to ELL. So that when you come back to the high needs, you roll it all up. That's where you get the 38 percent. But from a budget impact point of view, it's the special needs that has the most impact, right, on our budget. Well, they they all they all have different components the of impact. I mean, you have higher. some special ed students who don't place a high financial burden on the overall complexity of what we need to provide for them, and then you have. L students who might come in that have had very fragmented schooling, who are a level one L with no language and no language at home around English, and those students are at a higher percentage of need than the student who comes in where English is at home and they progress maybe more quickly through. So each child's individual, but they all, that's why they've created this high needs category because in conglomerate, they all require some level of additional budgetary impact. But I would never represent it as just special education. I think it's, it's you know, individual across. Some kids come with a combination of all three. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, it's really very, very individual. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the analysis is, I think, meaningful. And, and the reason for presenting this here is, is to give you perspective back to the growth score discussion versus the achievement discussion. We're going to, any district that has a higher level of high needs student, students, higher percent, their achievement scores uh, almost universally are somewhat depressed by that. And the growth score is a way of looking at how you're performing independent of it factors out. Like statisticians would talk about having a regression analysis to be able to look at your performance independent of the percent of high needs. So that's why this data is presented at the beginning. So you, so you commented to get to this chart that it's the roll up of the others. And so it's not the sum of the others, but it, it, it seems like a screwy scale to me because you're saying okay here's apples and apples here's oranges and oranges and here's pears and pears and now we're going to roll it up and we end up with that that doesn't make sense to me they give you both subgroups for looking at that so you can look at student needs across that but i think over the years and i'll let daniel defer on it but that they created the mechanism of high needs students because they were looking for different lenses to apply the MCAS scores to allow towns and districts to have more comparative data. So it's one way to kind of slice the data. And I think they did it because one, because they thought about it in a kind of a human quality, well it might be logical to wrap them together. 
the human quality of the impact mm -hmm. of the schooling and of the budgeting is that those layers of students require more attention, support, time, and mm -hmm. potentially financial resources. So they see it as indicative of both uh, sometimes budget and time and energy impact yeah. as well as performance impact. Again, but. So, so again, I'm still struggling Sorry. with the fact we've got 4,000 and something kids in the school system. The implication of this is 38% of those are high needs. Yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, it, it is, I completely agree with you that it's, it's not um, that useful to look at the category high needs by itself. I mean, I think there's, we get more, we look at subgroup data, I think it's, we want to look at our L's, they have a separate set of needs than our economically disadvantaged students and our special needs students. They are, are three distinct categories of students. Um, and just like you know, you were looking at the data for mental health by different subgroups, gender, LGBTQ, race, ethnicity, you get to um, a finer look at some of the thing issues that you have in terms of like learning needs that, that the kids have. Um, so, so high needs by definition doesn't just mean these three categories. Is that no, what it does. Saying? It does. It does. It does. But it's a so, screwball system. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Well, because I'm, mathematically, I'm, it doesn't I'm work. To. You got to use your microphone. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to understand. <laughs> like you, yeah. you said, how does it roll up to 38? 38 percent is concerning. How does it roll up to 38 percent of of all these three categories um, I would that I'm looking to, at? To me, it's not concerning. It's just who our students are. Right. The, There's no concern it's, there. It's it's it's. So, well, if it's 38 percent of the student population in the town of Westboro, we ought to be damn scared. Yeah. That's why I say it's a screwball. Well, so we're really scared proud of what though? That we're doing it's, that we do as well as we do. I'm, I mean, think about it. The kids that you just talked about that we look at that go to the colleges they go to go to do the schooling they do, present, live, thrive in Westboro are complex. So both things are true. It doesn't mean that they aren't doing well. It means what? that they have challenges that they overcome with our support, and they thrive. And it's, it's, a, it's a factor that helps us understand the level of effort attributed. But our kids are amazing, and they do really well. What they kind also of challenges is what we're trying to figure out. Um, how about yeah. if I present the MCAS data, <laughs> yeah. and, and then you can come back That's to the sir. demographic data later, but it's to give you a perspective yeah. on how we Thank compare you. to the other That's towns, right. and I don't disagree that you can question the category that the state has made yeah. called high needs, and we have some of our highest performing students are L students. So, right. you yeah. know, I mean, it's just... Um, the, the data is, you know, presented by the state. You ha have legitimate questions about the roll-up of it, but there are, you know, I mean, there are identifiable groups. Well, it's another example, I guess, of the state creating yardsticks that don't necessarily, one, make sense, or two, inform John Q. Average of what it is they're paying for in their taxes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I guess I'll keep my comments to that until we go okay. through the whole presentation and see how it plays out. But well, I, I, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> yeah, that's um, okay. Go ahead. I, I think this is a rhetorical device on the part of the state. The, the mistake that I think some of my colleagues might be making, or maybe mistake isn't the right word, I think they're presupposing that high needs means less than. All high needs means is there is a greater need for, um, it doesn't mean that they are incapable of thriving. So someone, so to use conventional sort of problematic statistics, someone could have an IQ of 245 and not speak English, by this criteria, they are high needs. Mm -hmm. oh, am I worried about that student? Absolutely not. So yes, I think we want to be careful with the way that the state is encapsulating this, because my, my colleagues 
are absolutely correct that this is creating a false category. And so we really want to think of what is it is being, what is being categorized. And what's being categorized is a way of looking at strategies for resourcing subgroups. And, and I think that's how we want to use it. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear otherwise, but that's, I mean, that, that's my take at least. Yeah, I'm, I'm Th happy with thanks that. Thanks for but clarifying. The, the issue is, to me, this will go up on our website. And unless they had the opportunity to listen to this discussion, which I think was a very adequate, uh, actually significant explanation of what we're doing this for, it, it looks damning. But then what else? I, I've presented this same data actually for the last several years. Yeah, so yeah. I don't understand. So, I mean, I, I, I we need to talk about that later. In a different way that it's gotten your attention, but I, this, is, this data hasn't yeah. changed. Yeah. Oh, well, I understand that. <laughs> and we've been hearing the numbers of each of these categories for many years. I mean, even the number of students in our, each of the programs and what support they're receiving. And, you know, Maybe it's the I, first time I understood right, what it's right. trying to say. Uh, and the, con the, the 38% isn't a con I don't know if we've seen, I, I, maybe you we have. have seen that one. What it doesn't make sense to me is if, it, if there's overlap, why it's, maybe there isn't an overlap on that number. But I, I've written out the percentages and it makes sense to me. It yeah. absolutely makes sense. Well, need, to Steve's point, and yeah, Steve Bachelor's point, need yeah. is a student who is high performing who's very capable, as your example is, could end up being in a, in a situation where they would perform less well if they didn't get what they need. Right. So when we think of need, this, is a, this isn't an assessment of, our, of us. It's not an assessment no. of the kids, you guys. This is an assessment of us and our performance of our teachers, of our right. curriculum, and of our instructional effort. So what they're saying is, hey, Westboro, you actually have kids that require layers of support. They have need that you need to provide, and you're doing a good job. You're providing what they need in order to perform well because here look at your performance and so need is more a message for us like those students have things they need you can't ignore them if you ignore them you're gonna get super low growth scores and you're gonna get low performance because you have a student who has immense capability but there are barriers like a barrier like language that they need support from us to overcome which is why seven years ago you shifted away from tutors for ELL students and moved to teachers. You committed to that because that was a need. And what you see is that the performance that you get and the growth and the capacity of our students has responded because we perform very well. So need, again, similarly, we've built dynamic special education programs that let our students be fully embedded in robust instruction because they have things that they can do and they need full access. But to get full access, we need to provide for them. So again, the need is directed to us, not the student. All right. So, so given, let's say, that we accept the number and the definition that we've just had, uh, that we have 38% of our student population has great needs, how now, well, have we met those needs? So do we have a slide that shows us that? <laughs> Oh, we've yeah. been showing those slides for. Uh, well, we, we we definitely. I'm talking about this presentation. Oh, yeah. Don't okay. tell oh, me my. what I saw for the last 15 years. Yes. Yeah, I'm talking about it's, this presentation. I want yeah. to see how it. it I'm not, I do not break out the subgroup analysis. I put the put it in the aggregate so you can see how we do compared to our benchmark communities. Yeah. I would be more than happy to do that for you. We do that internally. But it didn't. It didn't. See that the purpose. They don't be needed. Yeah. yeah the they is, right. The yeah, I think. I, I think I will. And <laughs> yeah. So the purpose of, of doing this is so you can see, you know, how on demographics we compare to our com uh, communities, and you'll see how on test scores, and you'll see that we are competitive, um, you know, in all subject areas with our fellow so I mean, comparables. <laughs> comparable. Um, I can just attest, like on the student end, like. I feel like what's been really unique about Westboro, like, the when I saw need, to me that instantly meant just, like, ki kids with regular friends at my school. It wasn't some kind of, like, special subgroup that needed tons and tons of attention. Like, growing up, I don't think most of us even realized which students 
were in certain things and where students weren't. And so by the time we were older, it was just like normal where some students need to st get extra time for tests, some students don't, or they might need other things. So I think like the culture of the school itself, I will say very, very well kind of like integrates it in a way where like need is just some people need certain things that other people just to make sure that we're on like a more equal playing field at the school. Welcome to Westboro Public Schools, <laughs> the culture that is that. So thank you so much, Rutrika, for explaining that because I think that is who Westboro is. <laughs> exactly that. So back to Dan. I'll, okay, let me back move to into Dan. discussing the COVID impact on learning and then I'll get to the benchmarking across our districts. And when I do talk about the COVID impact, um, there is one um, slide that I will talk about where I do break out one of the subgroups. So um, you, I, it's not uh, unknown to you or anybody who, that the COVID has, a, has had a substantial impact on um, our students' learning. Um, it, it's, uh, it would be surprising if, if it didn't, given how interrupted the, the experience was. Um, and um, there's a quote from Education Week that I put in here about how you know, there's no subgroup that uh, boys, girls, black, Hispanic, po high poverty, wealthy students that were you know, basically um, protected from the, having the negative impact. And, you know, so, but some of the steepest learning um, declines we see with some of the more, more vulnerable students. So I will just show you, um, hold on, sorry, the, um, <coughs> Mathematics, uh, this is the percentage point drop or in the aggregate for all students, grades three through eight, and it's the percentage point drop in terms of the percent of students meeting or exceeding expectations. So basically it said this is a 9% less or nine percentage points, fewer uh, less students are in the meeting and exceeding categories. So another way- We didn't do well. Pardon me? We didn't do well, right? We're actually um, we're eight. eight. Poorer than last. Year. Poorer than Two, last. Three, four, five. Last. I'm, I'm sorry. There was the steepest drop. Oh. In, uh, for yeah. yeah. Um, these are all very tight, you know, and similar. I mean, I think you look at it and you basically say that the state average is 10. We were at eight, right? And so the, the, the steepest drop is, you know, in Hudson and Franklin mm. and the state. Um, but it's fairly tight in terms of, you know, from our, in our benchmark districts. Same thing for ELA, it's a slightly higher drop for all of the communities, is, um, uh, but it's still <clears throat> pretty similar across communities. And one of the, um, you know, differences that I, I want to highlight that just as it's just clear in the in the, the state data, there's a difference between students who are coming from low income versus non low income households, and that you know it's it not um, it's not different than any other uh, community in, in the state averages that there was a larger uh, um, decline in these groups. That you know, <coughs> mathematics, it's like an eight times uh, lower uh, or larger mm -hmm. drop for uh, the low-income students and in, in, in ELA it's four, four times um, and so that you know those drops are just more significant for that subgroup so that said I just wanted to, you to have context that those that you know that across the state there were drops, the drops, the, 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 the decreases were more substantial for some of the subgroups. And now I want to move on to just showing you how we compare to our benchmark communities, which I think you'll be you know, pleased to see that we are on par, as we always have been, with these benchmark communities. And um, I'm going to start with math. I'm going to show you math slides and then some performance in English and then our science uh, performance. And <clears throat> each set of slides are, I have 
a 10th grade set of data, and then for, for math um, and for English, I also have grades three through eight that are rolled up together. Um, they do not roll up three through 10 because it's a different kind of test at the, at, in the high school. Um, but you can look at um, grade 10 separately and grades three through eight in math and ELA. And when we get to science, science is not tested in every, every grade level. It's only tested in grade five, eight, and in um, the high school. So for math, um, we scored a higher percentage of our students exceeded expectations uh, than uh, most of the benchmark communities. Higher than 12, 13 communities. Our growth scores were higher than five of the 13 benchmark communities. So, looking at, a, at this chart, you can see there's three years of data here for you to be able to look at, but what's highlighted here in green is the 2002 data. Um, you know, so you could look at the data and look at the, the drops and et cetera, but right now, for our purposes, we're saying how did we do compared to our benchmark communities? And in mathematics, you know, we are 38% uh, of our students are exceeding expectations. <clears throat> then when you look at growth scores, um, growth scores range from uh, 0 to 100. It, the 40 to 60 range is considered to be um, average. We tend to see high 50s to 60s you know, um, are what most communities that are our benchmarks are getting. Um, we're right in the mix there with the growth rate in the grade 10 math at um, 54. So grades through three through eight, um, compared to the state, we had 68% meeting and exceeding expectations compared to 39% at the state level. Our growth scores were higher than 10 of 13 of our benchmark communities. So if you look at, again, this is three through eight, so we've got about 1,500 students are um, <coughs> included in, these, in this data. Um, and you can see here that meeting or exceeding expectations were at 68%. Um, if you look at the surrounding districts here, it's pretty tightly clustered um, here. Um, 68, 68, 70, 70, 71, 71, 73. So this is like, it's, it's pretty indistinguishable in large measure among these communities. I mean, um, and then when you look at the growth scores, you can see we're up towards the top th a third of the, with our growth score of 60, which is uh, where we want to be. Um, so those are the math findings. Um, ELA. Again, I'm going to start with grade 10. While 84% uh, of the state were meeting and exceeding expectations, um, in Westboro, only 61% of the state made that benchmark. Uh, also, 23% of our students uh, exceeded expectations, and this is higher than 10 of 13 benchmark districts. So here you can see our percent at 23. Um, it's, it is tightly clustered again, you know, with our benchmark communities. Up, up here, all of these are fairly, you know, tight and indistinguishable. Again, like I love my checkup analogy, we want to be in the mix. You know, we're not, this is not a competition so much. <laughs> these are our peers and, and our performance. Uh, we're expecting to be on par with them. So those are our uh, achievement levels. And then there's the growth here, and our growth is at 52, which um, I would have been more concerned about if our achievement wasn't so high, but given that our achievement is, is high relative um, to the benchmark communities, having a 52 growth, uh, growth score is not um, of concern, I don't think. So uh, <clears throat> three through eight, 65% uh, meeting or exceeding expectations, 65% uh, in Westboro compared to 41% of the state, and our growth scores were higher than 10 of 14 districts. So let me show you, here's achievement, meeting or exceeding, 62, um, and then growth scores up at 60 for ELA. 
science, um, grades five, eight, and 10, um, there's no growth scores because science isn't uh, tested every year, so you don't have a prior year's test score to go off of. The way that growth score works is you have two prior years of data from your two prior grades. So they just have achievement data. Um, and you can see that 79% <clears throat> of our 10th graders were meeting or exceeding expectations in our high school biology class. And at the state level, it's only 45%. Um, and in grades five through eight, our um, students also scored significantly above the state average. Um, it's a complicated test at five through eight, or I shouldn't say complicated, it's a controversial to some degree because it rolls up three grade levels worth of learning. Yeah. Um, and so you basically have science standards that are third, fourth, and fifth being tested on the fifth grade test. So it's a little bit like, uh, you know, it's not as precise as at the 10th grade where you're measuring what's learned that year and it has to do with biology. Most of our students take biology. There's a few exceptions that we have, but the vast majority take biology. So, you know, the, the fifth through eighth score, uh, let me just first tell you that here's the 10th grade score, 26% um, <clears throat> scored, exceed expectations, it's fairly, tight in here in terms of the groupings. The state adapted a new standard for a cutoff to meet the exceeding expectations. So there's the, the big drop you see is not a COVID drop so much as a new cut point that's created. Um, and so, but again, we're right in the mix uh, with, with our uh, peer high schools. Um, and then in grade five, we have 65% of our students um, were scored meets or exceeds <clears throat> in grades eight, uh, also 65% of our students meets and, and or exceeds. So um, I told you I'd go through those data charts fairly quickly, I did. Um, <laughs> if you, you know, go back to the beginning and the, you know, the discussion we were having about benchmarking, you can see, you know, maybe that gives you some perspective of I was just, again, wanted you to know what the relative makeup of the districts are among these demographics that we used in part to select our benchmark communities. Um, and so, you know, now you have a picture in terms of overall performance that we're performing on par with our benchmark communities. And what we do with this data is we start to break it down by grade level, we look at it by t teacher we level, we look at it by the subset of item analysis you can do where you can look at uh, reports to see content coverage in places where we may have um, not put enough time in terms of our coverage. Like for example, in mathematics, we may see like ratios was a particular area where we didn't score as well as we would have liked. It could have been in some classrooms or some grade levels. And then it becomes like an issue of pacing and calibrating and making sure our curriculum is um, covering all the dimensions that we wanted to cover on the NCAS. So um, again, you know, my, you know, the purpose of, I think, our report is, is like for you guys to see we're performing well. Everybody across the state had, has somewhat depressed scores. It's not a huge depression. Uh, and, and, um, but um, in terms of our performance compared to our peers, we're exactly where we've been in the past, which is a good place to be. So I think it'll be very interesting to see the, um, again, like the next round of testing as we look. I mean, I think the state will be looking at it closely as will we to see how students um, spring back from, um, you know, two years of very fragmented um, instruction in some cases across the state. And, um, you know, we feel very, good about how we performed and worked with students during a really challenging instructional stretch. Um, I'm not surprised to see the science impacted given that like labs were impacted and some of the content which we keep very hands on and things around just looking at um, conceptual development. That's a harder one for the younger students not present and so it wouldn't surprise me if we were doing less science during that stretch. So we want to see that spring back. You know, while kids were virtual we were 
really, I think, impacted in certain areas. So the, you know, we're looking forward to actually digging in on um, doing what we know to do, working with students, and then seeing how our data um, springs back. So, I, I want to go back to maybe third or fourth slide where we were comparing the COVID impacts against the, um, you know, our peers. Mm -hmm. um, you want math, PLA? Uh, yeah, the the uh, three through eight where there it is. We were so much different than. Well, let's let's say if you look at that that trend, um, and is there something to learn, if you will, from this? What was Lexington doing in regards to that group versus where we were? We were in effect based on this change, uh, roughly four times worse. So what were they doing that somehow or another? Um, it resulted in, in that number versus where we are. Is it a diversity issue in terms of what that population was doing, our population was doing based on their yeah. um, their needs versus I mean, it, it, Lexington, yeah, which I mean, I think that's before. that's part of the reason that this slide's here is uh, you know, the, that we know that low-income houses are, have um, challenges when it comes to they're being able to provide the support at home and, and, and that perhaps and, and both parents were gone and the kids yeah. didn't have so money to help them do it yeah i mean it's, it's very demanding to have to learn on an online environment um and so if you're if you're under resourced at, at home and you have some um that, that can cause issues and so you know when you look at um the demographics here in terms of economically disadvantaged um, yeah there's yeah in effect yeah that is just the reverse of what right. the other yes. one looks yeah. like right. the same reason probably right. yep. yeah and that's that why reflects, I say it's another yeah. screwball story that doesn't help a community that has a very diverse background which we do and so you could also say and I guess I'm willing to say it is that Although the younger grades suffered as a result of COVID, the, by the time that uh, problem of diversity goes away, by the time they get into 10th grade, they did as well because some of those problems have gone away. The ELL issues are reduced uh, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, the trajectory of their learning, the trajectory of student learning continues to improve as students against any of their particular learning um, challenges or needs or interests get stronger and stronger as they progress through school. So when you get to, say, our Trika saying, like, by the time you get to the high school, the cultural climate and design is that all, and this is what it is at the elementary school, too, all students get what they need, all students don't need the same thing. So when you look at that, the question is, are you applying that brush appropriately and making sure that students are getting what they need? And when you look at the trajectory of our growth, Yes, we remain very high performing, and that our students in their trajectory, by the time they put all those pieces of learning together, and the benefits of low class size, good instruction, um, embedded supports mean that by the time they get to high school, they're, they're able to access their learning at a high level. So, so yeah. we'll find out whether or not this uh, uh, diversity issue goes away in two years to four years in terms of what the results of this in the future years are going to be. Mm. Because if it's truly what we just said, i.e. we have a, a, a superior process by which the kids catch up, if you will, no matter where they are when they get to the system, but over the years uh, the process brings everybody up to a performance level, or at least I hope we can say that, to a performance level that is uh, generally better than most communities of our peers and so to the extent that that happens in two years in the testing I, I, I don't know that I'll still be here then but uh, I mean our it, performance it yeah, right if you track statistically Westboro's performance across all benchmarks we, we remain incredibly competitive and we have the same kids we've always had I mean so yeah, the, but the, I'm speaking you know, specifically of the COVID impact yeah, specifically around the COVID impact there's no doubt that across the state and in Westboro and any community students for whatever complexity of need who suffered more loss 
how quickly can we make up that ground? Right. And we have students that come from, you know, all sorts of settings, not necessarily high need settings, but just struggled emotionally, and that would have nothing to do with anything other than that emotional struggle that found the complexity of learning at home really hard. Some of our most leveraged, immensely talented students found learning from home really difficult because they thrive on their peers and being together and the energy of the school setting. So those students felt very disengaged and found it very hard to learn as well. So for whatever package of needs that students struggled and they might have a gap, the question is how quickly we close that, yes. And that's the work where you know the data will tell us how we're doing. Um, I think we have, did you have a comment? I did, um, and um, I would just like to um, call some clarity to something that you were saying, Mr. Durrett, um, about we're talking about high needs students and I don't, you were using the word diversity, and I think you were interchanging the word diversity and high needs, and I don't think those no, two no, were. No, it, it was unrelated to, to the high needs. I accept the high needs being kids that, um, let's, let's say, need more support. I'm mm -hmm. willing to, but, and, and that may be the difference in the way I picked up this discussion, high needs being something different than I interpreted that phrase to me. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I use the word diversity to say that, in fact, we have kids that come from everywhere whose home background is, is perhaps radically different than the home background of kids that might be in Lexington. That's what I was trying to suggest. And in fact, as a result of that, if you didn't have a computer at home, if, if, you, if your parents were working and you didn't have anybody to help supervise what you were doing the other day, mm -hmm. that's different than perhaps what a family in Lexington uh, experience during the same period. That's what I meant by diversity. Okay. I appreciate that because sometimes people use the word diversity to also talk about race and yeah. I'm thinking that, you know, we don't want to make any judgments about students of low income and, no, and race and things like that, that. So, you know, they're, where they were when they weren't in school might be totally different between, you know, any student in our population. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move right along to our budget presentations. That was the most um, robust MCAS report we've had yeah. in a while. <laughs> we true. haven't looked at this data. We haven't walked this walk. It was so well-worn for us. Year over year, you've looked at MCAS data, and you get a rhythm for seeing year to year. And it's, one, it's been a chunk of time since we looked at it, and the data has the COVID of complexity layer. So, you know, I think you'll see that, one, um, you know, we're, we're looking to uh, really um, study it, and I think that's what we do, so it'll be, it'll be good. So now you get to move into enrollment, so we're going to kind of make a shift. Um, this is the first of two reports. Daniel will do this one, and then Dave and I will do the next one. Um, looking at the first piece, which is enrollment, and since, um, you know, a big part of mm -hmm. our budget, 83%, is staff and enrollment needs and all the things we've been talking about. Um, this is an important report to the budgeting. Okay, so um, enrollment trends, let me give you the uh, o overview at the district level and then I'll give you a presentation by uh, grade level in school so you can see what our uh, uh, anticipated class size is for next year. So um, it shows you our Three that right now, as of like uh, the third of of uh, November, where our numbers always fluctuate a little bit, but we're at three thousand eight hundred and forty four students, and that is down twelve students from last year. Um, the three eight five six number there. So we're basically, you know, virtually, I you know, the same. Um, as we were, we never quite know how much the change is going to be in a given year. Um, there's some building that's happening in town at, uh, what's the name of the... Uh, uh, Silver Hollow is probably the largest one. That's 26 and, and houses. And it's not particularly, yeah. I mean, and, and it's going to be stretched out over a few years. Yep, three so years. Yeah, so, yeah. so we're not, um, you know, it, it, at one point we were, several years ago, you remember there was some substantial growth and we mm -hmm. were, you know, seeing an influx of students. But we're, we're not predicting big changes between this year and next year. And so we 
but we, you know, we never entirely know. So I'll tell you what we do in terms of um, how we estimate our class sizes in a minute. Let me just remind you that there's um, a guideline that the school committee set in terms of what we consider to be the range that we would like to keep our classes in for optimal teaching and learning. And so um, you can see here it, it makes sense the smaller classes for the younger kiddos, so 16 to 21 at K1, 18 to 22, 2 to 3, um, 20 to 24 at 46, and then 21 to 25, 7 to 8. Um, so let me give you a sense of what, what's going on here is looking at our school numbers, this year's numbers, <clears throat> and projected numbers for next year. And the way we do the projection is we basically estimate the number of kindergartners that are going to come in based on an average of the last several years. And so we come up with a prediction of what our kindergarten numbers will look like but we do know how many third graders are going to be, for example, graduating from Fales and Hastings and Armstrong and, um, you know, moving on up to Mill Pond, how many sixth graders at Mill Pond are graduate, moving into Gibbons and Gibbons, et cetera, right? So yeah. we'll be, there are eighth graders are moving up to the high school and the 12th grade is moving to graduation. So the numbers <clears throat> are, if, if you assume we don't, have an influx of students, everything is about the same next year, this is what we would expect our, our schools to experience in terms of a change. Um, so fails going down by, you know, um, WEC going down by maybe by five, fails by 16. So basically, um, Hastings going up by six, Armstrong down by 16, Mill Pond down by 11, Gibbons down by two. We have this bump that was that's moving up into the high school of 35 students, um, and so the estimate for the whole district is like going down by maybe nine students. So um, what we do then is we take existing staff and say, given how many students will be in a building. What would the class size look like when we roll everybody up to the next grade level? Um, and you can see here um, basically our kindergarten numbers, grade one, grade two, grade three. These are very um, good numbers for us to have. They're not out of the range of our guidelines, but they're at, they are at the low end. Um, and um, given what our conversation about COVID that we just had, that is a good thing. Um, the best way to, you know, take care of our students' needs is to give them um, as much proximity to their teacher and attention from a teacher as we can give them. So having small class sizes in this environment um, as we're recovering from COVID is a good thing. Um, our class size estimates at Mill Pond and Gibbons also uh, at the low end, um, again, within the range. Um, and then at the high school, class size is a harder thing to, to sort of keep a handle on because you go from basically having predictable teams of teachers that are working with the, the students or traveling in pods <laughs> um, to then electives <coughs> and levels and you are, have all kinds of sectioning that happens based on you know, some kids who want to be in band and chorus and, and you know, when the, when the biology class meets in, during the course of the day, uh, some sections end up being larger than other sections. And so the sectioning, you know, we've got a, a total of 514 sections at our high school right now. Um, this is not, I'm not predicting into next year because we never quite know until we do the scheduling what our sections are going to look like, whether we will have some of these larger sections. Um, so of the 514 sections that are there right now, 488 are within this 10 to 24 range. Um, but then there's about 5% of our sections that fall in a, at a large, 
at, at, the, at the higher level. So nine with 25 students, we've got 13 with 26 students, and we have three with 27, and I no, one with 27, and then three with 28. So like I said, 5% of the classes are larger, you know, at the, that higher level. Um, and with 65, mm, mm, not 65, 35 new students coming up to the high school, um, it's hard to predict what the um, class, like how many more students would end up being in that, we don't want them to be in classes of, of higher than 24, we try to avoid that. Um, but we do basically feel like that that's something to watch. So um, not to belabor the point here about uh, what's going on with enrollment, um, I'm just going to reiterate what I said, which is our class size level K to 8 um, looks very good to us. Um, the 35 moving up to the high school is a slight concern. We don't think we need to ask for a new FTE because we do think that we would be able to do some kind of, through attrition, um, have a, an additional FTE up at the high school to help offset class size, um, but without putting in for a position. So we could offset it, and what the high school very often has to do uh, a point two, um, you know, in the math department, a point two in the science department, and we, we don't know until we do the scheduling, which starts in um, May. The, well, uh, actually April. earlier, it starts yeah. in, in the winter, and we, we basically are almost finishing it by April, May. So we will get a clearer picture of, you know, where we might have to hire a point to here or there. And again... It's the same thing we did last year. We reduced at fails one section and then utilized FTE at the high school to lower class size as those students increased. I fully anticipate, and we didn't ascertain where that would come from until, you know, we got to the end of the year. I mean, clearly we're at, at this point what we would deem as stable enrollment. You could end up with five more kids or five less. Like, we're in a good place where, you know, it would be, it just feels good to get back to some level of predictability and stability, and we're hopeful to maintain that. So right now we anticipate we will move one FTE from somewhere K to six and be able to leverage that um, at the high school for additional FTE and then Brian and his team will request that working with department heads around sectioning. I think the high school is very responsive to make sure when kids want a class they get it at the end of the year last year. What was our kerfluffle? We had a we had a group of kids. Biology. That, was it biology? There you go. Um, AP. We, AP, biology. AP biology and so we actually added a section. Yep. So um, you know, he called me, he's like, we're gonna have like 20, like 15 kids that can't get the class they want. And I said, that's not how we do it. Mm -hmm. Let's get them the class. So, you know, we made some instructional changes and added one section, which was ended up being like a little less than point two. So, you know, that's the way we do it. And oftentimes you have to just wait until you see, but we're always trying to make sure we can leverage what they need. And I think one of those class sections, one of those classes ended up being a little bigger, but they were like, better they have it and they get in. So, you know, I think that's what we anticipate doing right now. And I think it feels like no new staffing needed across district as we respond to kind of finally getting back to more level programming. So that, that's my summary on enrollment. Any questions from the committee? Okay, we're gonna move on to <laughs> budget presentation number two. So as you shift from budget one to budget two, as we pull up the other, I think, and Dave and I will you know, kind of dive in on this one. Um, you know we continue to track enrollment. You'll get regular updates from us now. We'll uh, keep you abreast of staffing. But given that we're in a little bit better stability, we certainly feel like then what Dave moves to right now is rolling all the staffing for steps and lanes and um, and then waiting on uh, finalization hopefully of the contract to give us any changes that would take place in overall cost but once we establish based upon Daniel's report that we take the staff we have to move forward he digs in on all of that so um, so tonight what we start with is kind of the first framing of presentation one 
Presentation one is always big picture. It's kind of toe in the water. We look at all of the large potential number impacts and all of the requests. And then between, I think the biggest jump we make in data and analysis is between this presentation and the one next week, where we try to then combine that and give you an overview of really percentage of a total budget impact based upon some preliminary decisions. Then moving to our final recommendation, like quickly and you receive the final recommendation by November 30th. So, and you've got Thanksgiving in there and a lot of trajectory of intensity, you know. So, um, you know, Dave's already laying out presentations three and four. So he's got the rhythm in place. So tonight we'll dive in on one and, uh, you know, walk through it. So we're gonna walk you through a timeline. We always begin by helping you kind of put your head back in the year we're currently in. We've cracked the book on FY23. We just returned from town meeting seeking additional support for which we received um, acknowledgement at the town level around the impacts of our out of district. You'll see some of that tonight, we'll share our goals. We'll look at 23 a little bit just to kind of get your head in it because the budget grows off of that one. Um, as we you know work within what we've got and then we'll preview kind of the big ticket items that are starting to come in. Timeline wise, you can see right where you are. You're at the bottom of column one on November 9th. Lots of preliminary work has been done and then it condenses down to a lot happening between now and the 30th. One of the things we've done in the last couple of years that's very good is we've built two weeks between the 30th and the 14th when you vote your final approval. And over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of good quality discussion, small group discussion, meeting with different people and taking feedback. And I certainly, in the trajectory of my budgeting with you, you know, we've made movement in there as needed between my final recommendation and then uh, that comes from Dave and I and then what, what you vote. Um, some years it's rolled right out of our recommendation and other years we've gone back and done some more work. So, you know, that just lays the ground for you. So um, I really think that we're always focused on maintaining excellence, looking at respect, investment, and collaboration in the process. We've really refined that and continuing to be strategic in how we're innovation and forward thinking in the way that we build our budget. So let's look at where we are. Um, this is budget history for our trajectory. We always kind of show it. I, you know, again, as we look at like, what's the purpose of this slide? I think for me, the purpose of this slide is that each year the budget stands alone and the needs that we request are based upon the status of that year. And I think if you look at the trajectory of the percentages over multiple years, you can see that in years where we needed less of a percentage to move forward, we had a lower percent request. And in years we had contract negotiations or substantive changes in programming or growth in enrollment, you saw budget percentages that were larger. So this year we're developing this one and it's based upon the needs of this year. It's not going to make assumptions that, you know, any percentage is what we're coming back with. It's literally based upon when we roll this budget and work forward to have faculty kind of look at what those needs are. So this slide here is um, essentially a, a snapshot of uh, FY22 and FY23. FY um, the uh, approved budget mm -hmm. for FY23. Um, <clears throat> And what do we wanted to do uh, as uh, Amber Metro was basically kind of lay the groundwork for next steps and how we build off basically um, the uh, the budget that you have recommended and that we've been able to execute, but to also as we step forward be cognizant of everything that's going on in today's world, which would be inflation, which we know of the impact to student services. Um, uh, Facilities, obviously, and then as um, as last year's um, presentation presented, uh, mm -hmm. always being mindful of technology and the infrastructures that support and surround our kids. Um, I think, as Amber has described, technology is pretty much the backbone of our organization. And so, I think the importance of this snapshot that lets you look at, you know, in years twenty and twenty one, we did budget reductions while we were embedded in COVID. Um, but when you look at 22 
and 23, you basically see that across all of those categories, we worked collaboratively together and we level funded all of those. So district-wide, you look at basically there's flat changes in all of those major categories. Um, it, and you see basically inclusive of transportation and facilities, which was level funded for the last two years um, and cut in the years before that, which we'll review but that you had this distinctive area of the big gap. Remember that was circuit breaker gap was that 630,999 between increase in tuitions and what we got in circuit breaker and what we had budgeted from the year before. So that was the big layer and that was 1% right there in student services, which was the, the circuit breaker gap. And then we made the modest addition to the technology based upon trying to bring um, John back from $200,000 worth of cuts over the last several years, and then athletics against um, increase in costs, again, very minor. So that's just really, and then everything else, if you look at that as you step forward into the next slide. Yeah. The only additive I would add is that when Amber mentioned the 1%, you know, the budget itself was the $60 million, so you see the $600,000, so just, just in case anybody Sorry, that's how I think of it in my head. Um, so this is, again, just a remembrance. This is right out of the budget book. It's right out of last year's presentation. This is where we ended up at the close of last year. There's that 60 million 410, so which is why I say when I see 603,000, for me, that's 1%. So when I'm estimating kind of where we are as people are putting in requests, I'm kind of like rolling that in my head. That's kind of how I come at it, and Dave has all sorts of layers of much more complexity. Um, so again, you see you captured there the same, but then you see the roll in of the staffing. So you basically see that last year, the roll of the salaries was the 4% the increase all in on the uh, contract with teachers. So we anticipated, we knew that it was 3.5 with a 0.5 on the last day in effect of four total when you rolled that budget, um, but we didn't face all of the total impact of that money right at once. And then you see total operational costs. Those were related to um, you know, increases in contracts and transportation and utilities. The only other additive I would add is the comment at the bottom, right, is the proposed increase uh, is inclusive of the $103,000. That was our ask for uh, the additional payroll person and I believe uh, ELL was uh, a staffing that we did mm -hmm. increase, which came kind of later in the process, mm -hmm. which Amber and Daniel talked about in their last presentation. And then, of course, we uh, utilize, to the best of our ability, the, the community ed offset, which is um, which I usually define as kind of a central contribution to the community ed, from the community ed program. So that gives you a snapshot. That should feel memorable. That's where we are right now. This is the budget we're currently implementing. Mm -hmm. right. And um, the, uh, again, just one additional additive, um, just be mindful, that's as of special town meeting. So there's a slight variance in numbers, and you'll see that on the next presentation, um, which calls everything out a little more. But what, again, to set the stage, this is the overview, plus the identifiers for what we want to cue you in on as we continue to progress and plan the budgets going forward. So we rolled everything out to all the um, departments. We walked it through with them. We asked them to go back in and to cut their budgets where they could to make direct funding requests based upon need if they couldn't do a reallocation within their budget and to give those the targeted needs. You know, in the past several years, that's how we've always asked them to come forward so you see what they're thinking about and what they think their needs are and what their requests are. And between now and the 16th, we kind of tear those out and look at their impact across our budgeting. Um, so what do we know now? I can tell you what we know now as of today from the requests that have come in and the numbers that Dave is putting in front of me and of the team as he starts to kind of pull in different pieces. One, we know that we have major contract negotiations at play. So you have all of the contract negotiations for every one of these units across the district. The non-union positions, administrators, maintenance, uh, small maintenance team and technology team across the district typically run somewhat parallel to contract negotiations. So again, like there's there's kind of rough estimates. They're not they're not in negotiation with us. They certainly look to some of those benchmarks and they come prepared to negotiations just as any other group does to talk about um, you know what their needs are. Um, when you look at the large number of costs centered to contract wise across the top, it's it's all the ones you see. 
Um, and as we settle those units, um, that will impact the salary base that we hopefully get to as quickly as possible for town meeting. You also have transportation. I mean, I just want to give a shout out to what a strong collaborative model Lisa and Dave and, and um, Cindy and our team have and Ragu staying on the pieces around innovation. This is a team where you guys are really tracking transportation and paying really close attention. Um, typically in contract, we've always reflected the CPI as a benchmark that the contract thinks we should an potentially anticipate. Um, and that would be the 225 that you see there. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see, given the discussions that are going around, yep. what contracts, you know, with their fuel costs, with, I mean, I imagine it's going to be a very interesting year. Yeah, and I think just uh, some additional perspectives that we want to consider when we, you know, what, what the actual number may be, do we go flat? Um, it's more an investment in kind of, um, a, again, collaborative nature with um, Johanna, Roger, uh, related to COVID and, you know, the progression of when we kind of, so to speak, as COVID gone or field trips back. A lot of that stuff does come from community fund, um, student activity funds, but at the same time, um, it, it's all part of the big picture. So we want to just be cognizant of the fact that we don't want to necessarily potentially level fund something, even though we we feel like we have some surplus here and there over the past years because of COVID and the impact. We want to be mindful of just, I guess, lifting every stone and looking behind every corner to ensure that if we are going to increase the budget line, what is a truer number and what should she be like? At this point, which is very preliminary, I don't believe it's going to be the 7.3%, but again, it's, we're in the early stages of having those discussions. It's just uh, required. Yeah, no, I think that's um, really salient. I think the other part of that is that you know, we ran as we've really continued to look at strong equity-based work and making sure all students have access to everything we do. We added the late bus at the high school or at the given so that the football team could go and we then also ran it as a late bus across district so all kids could have access and actually students at the high school and Gibbons had asked if they could start using the bus once they found there was another one running on a, on a late day. So there's obviously demand and interest in students being able to stay late and access the late bus that we um, offered for that strand of sports. And so we're picking up kind of a new piece of information. I certainly think that if running robust organizations and providing after school time for homework and supports means having a late bus, then that might be a piece of our work. Um, we've then had offsets where maybe fewer, in the last couple of years, fewer field trips ran, to his point. So we had some offsets there that we could work with. So we're just going to have to track it, but we level funded it last year. And what we don't want to do is get in a situation where we bite ourselves if they come back with high fuel costs and you know, needing to increase paying their drivers more. Um, you look at what's going on in the industry, like any of those could bite us in their cost escalations. So the trick right now is to try to figure out what number works. Uh, this slide right here is essentially um, not to be redundant, which I, I know you've all seen several times, um, is basically to, you know, just update you and, and remind you or refresh your memories related to uh, what occurred this year um, with the student services. Um, at, at town meeting, we know we got the appropriation that we asked for, um, almost in that, in the amount that, that we did request, part of it being the raise it appropriate, some of it from free cash. Um, but I wanted to put this up there as, again, that, that, that number, the 628, will be included in the budget. So you'll see, you'll automatically see a larger increase going into FY24. Um, the, the budget number has changed to add that number in. So then we, once Sherry and I work together with Amber about appropriateness for the uh, student services budget, you'll see an increase. But it, this is a refresher to remind you that that's part of the driver. This slide right here is some very recent information that we received from OSD. Um, OSD is the um, Department of Operational Service Division. They essentially prepare districts every year for what is an appropriate kind of increase for not only materials and, materials and supplies, your relationship with vendors as you budget. Here's a percentage that you should increase by. Um, and uh, they actually also have indicator as to 
the pricing range for added district services. Mm -hmm. So they basically cover the gamut of everything, um, educational facilities and in, in districts without the state. Um, as you can see from the history going back to FY15, the, the increases have been minimal. Um, and most of the time when you plan for your budget, you consider inflation, whether it's cost of living, just, just kind of a general rollover and adding two or 3%, it seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. Uh, this year, not, I wouldn't say about four weeks ago, we received a message that the initial number was just for OSD related to operations and maintenance, so the O&M side of the budget. Um, about two weeks later, we, re we received notice that it would include special ed and out of district services as well. So basically, the indicator was, depending on how districts want to manage their budget, specific line items or just holistically, that a safe number would be 14%. There's a multitude of drivers. Um, I'm happy to share any sites with you guys if you want to do additional investigation. They, they actually presented to us recently um, and articulated it well. However, there was a lot of people just still shaking their hands and you know, in disbelief. Um, it, it's essentially the culmination of everything that we've heard about on the new supply chain issues, transportation, shortages. Um, and I think there's some... Um, some uh, liberties that I think the vendors are taking, which I think are starting to be static more so than just uh, specific liberties to individuals. Are we required to buy only from OSD? I'm sorry? Are we required to buy only through OSD? OSD just sets the rates for us. They, we don't buy from them per se, but they basically are a governance board, so to speak, as to what they are predicting would be a suitable increase for your budget, so, so you manage the budget. they set the rate and we have to pay it? It's not so much of a setting rate, it's a recommendation based okay. on what they're seeing in the so industry. It's, it's kind of like prepare it's yourself. Okay. Yeah. It's what they might grant to uh, vendors and supply services. Exactly. It, that's so exactly it. Sorry. <laughs> the, the, this particular number is what uh, that government agency might grant to the vendors that supply general services to the school departments. So any, any outfit that's regulated by them will have that percent increase, which goes to out-of-district services. Yep. So again, it, it we, we, in, we initially felt that, you know, based on facilities history within Westboro, we thought, you know, this might be a suitable time to, you know, restore some of the cuts. Um, as we started pulling it apart, we realized that it was a, a larger number. And then once we came out again, as I mentioned, about two weeks after the initial presentation of them, they said, yes, you also need to include Department of Student Services. That's where it really... That, that uh, blew up the... That was, yes, that was the, that, yeah. was the, uh, that was the... Uh, all of us waving the right white right. flag saying, like, this is probably unsustainable. So I want to put it in there. Amber and I are continually being strategic of how we do it. Um, obviously, being student-centric and student-focused, we want to be mindful of the fact that we never cut a budget whereas it impacts the kids but this is one of those years where we're going to have to make some tough decisions ensuring that um, service um, equity um, and delivery all that maintained in service but how do we do so with just being mindful that things are going to cost more i think when we look at that discussion too i mean again it's like you're going to pay more for electricity you're going to pay more for utilities we're paying more for services we're paying more for cost calls we're paying more for when the plumber comes and then if you layer that in across out of district services where the percent on a $100,000 placement or a $200,000 placement escalates all of your costs as well as your transportation costs, you're not getting more for that. It's just going to be the cost of doing business. And so to see them push that number out definitely led to a lot of <laughs> excited reaction and uh, not all good on any level from all of the superintendents at the conference were buzzing about it. And there's certainly action but you know they've opened the door and put that number out there so vendors are going to latch onto that so yeah. it's it's concerning and a part that we're calling out and i think we just need to prepare appropriately and you'll see that in some of our, our budget work just the only additive was this is the uh, the importance of the collaborative efforts working with the principals saying um you know historically asking you to take a kind of almost a um um an approach um kind of out of the Mike Peretti book, I see him in the back, is the zero-based budgeting, is really to kind of build your budget from the bottom up. See what your true needs are. Um, you know, we are helping the principals look at prior expenses. What are your true needs? And then, and then going from there. And if there is opportunity to um, level fund or to add minimally based on those assessments of the needs, then we'll hope to be in a better place. But again, 
this is all a work in progress. So let's look at just the large cost center areas where we have numbers that we're going to track and pay attention to, and you'll see them when we come in on the next presentation as they start to fall into the budgeting. One, we're tracking the placement costs that were covered by free cash. Those hovered around 200,000. Um, you remember when you were uh, you saw a percentage cost. Remember, because we we uh, we had two students anticipated to moving to their out of district placement, but we prorated that cost because it was coming later. So it was like 86,000, 80. So you're looking at an estimate of 100,000 each if they would then roll into tuition placements next year. We're tracking that and hoping that what we can do is not planning on rolling that into the budget, but assuming that we would have offsets, maybe a student would age out, we track that. We also know there's kids coming in. So we're always working within that number. It's our hope not to have to carry that into tuition settings, but that we would have other offsets of students coming back to program. Um, again, we're always, it's a very fluid uh, part of our industry. So it's not my thinking right now that we would be pulling that number back in. I'm just holding it out there to you as kind of a cost risk that we're looking at. Um, then you have the part that David just was talking about and across the out of district uh, sped tuition increases, I applied 14% as well Dave did. Dave applied 14% and sent me the number <laughs> and he put it in red so I could <laughs> see it. Um, and again, when you got your presentation, it was 387 and now it's yeah. 464. So welcome to the fluid nature of what it is for out of district tuition costs. Um, so, you know, that's 14% on the top of the current cost. So how we absorb that and what we do with whether or not we ask for that 14% or whether we carry that, those are all part of where we are right now. Okay. Just uh, one additional, uh, just to give you clarity on the out of district, um, it is essentially the way our budget is broken down is to out of district and collaborative costs. So the out of district and collaborative costs is about 2.7 million. Um, and then if you factor in the additional supports we got because of the added districts of that 628, you're around 3.3. 14 percent um, of that is basically what you're going to get. Um, it's yeah. 470, 460 yeah. number. So that that's how we get that number. So that, as she said, um, necessary for for achievement and support of the student, but in terms of kind of. Um, return on investment, so to speak, like we're not getting out of anything out of it other than just a line item that's new. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll, will the circuit breaker then reflect the increased cost so, increase? So there, there's potentially some good news and bad news about circuit, I shouldn't say that, there's TBD news as she wrote, <laughs> circuit breaker historically over the last two years has been 75%. We're hoping for getting the same amount. There has been some chit chatter about because of the OSD increases, will the state, as they've been talking about their surplus and all their mm -hmm. additional funds, could they potentially increase it for one year to help all districts in the state recover a little bit from that 14%? A lot of that's TBD. A lot of that could come after <laughs> the fact, considering the Westboro budget process is so expedited. Um, it would be a good news story, but what we're doing is to we're building that uh, circuit breaker sheet now, and what we're planning on is a solid 75% of that, and we'll have that number on. You'll on see like that in 16. that classic circuit breaker slide where we, where we break it out. And again, you remember the, the spring back of circuit breaker going up against the increase in our out-of-district tuitions is a year behind. Mm, yeah. So that gap is still going to be there, and unless the state comes through, we will have a gap. But you also then with the additional um, coverage that was provided at town meeting, it certainly lowered that gap or it would have been gigantic. Um, so those are numbers we're looking at right now. Those are ones that are kind of like all big trajectories where we're tracking them and making decisions around what's the best number for us to carry that limits risk and maximizes, you know, stability, right? So let's then look at what we know about what we've all seen in buildings and grounds. So there's a couple things for us to think about. Um, and Dave and I will kind of do this one together. So during COVID, buildings and grounds, we cut it, we cut it more than 61,000, but I only went back one budget. And when we went back one budget, we cut buildings and grounds by 61,000. Sh we shaved out to lower our budget when we were really looking. Remember when we went back after we met with the 
the big budget hearing with FinCom and everybody, we went back and we cut more and we cut it across multiple layers of service and it was like 10,000 from the phones. It was 20,000 from trash. Like I went through and I just took some literal cuts. I just cut them. I'm like, let's pack the trash tighter. <laughs> you know, we just cut them. We just went in and we did like literally a surgical cut and we spread it across the services. That was 61,000 out of buildings and grounds. We then have done two years of level funding where we have not increased buildings and grounds at all. Now, that has a compounding impact when we look at the continued escalation of what we're seeing in the costs when anybody walks through the door or calls us with a part to replace. So the plumbing is a very good example. If we have a plumbing backup, the cost is several thousand dollars just when they come and they you know, help us check a sump pump or undo something. Like it's definitely expensive. We do everything we can in house. We bought our own routers. Like we do a lot in house, but we have six buildings and a lot of moving parts. And so the cost escalation clearly around electricity, we know is going to go up. Um, Dave locked in numbers so he can calculate that percentage. Um, grounds projects and maintenance and general repairs. Um, we had, for example, we typically, when we have a building repair during the year, it will come out of the maintenance line item of the building. So Mill Pond has a maintenance line item for their building. We just got a $42,000 bill where we have to replace the sump pump in the septic system at the Mill Pond. So we will make that purchase out of buildings and grounds and it might end up running in deficit and we'll track it. But what happens is against the general escalation of like, I think that cost three years ago would have probably been 20. Like the cost escalations are starting to feel like just big chunks where carrying that in your general maintenance budget isn't sustainable if we aren't, you know, adding some increases in there. We're trying to be strategic in it, but we ask them to really go back in and look at the cost impacts against the last two years of kind of where they're seeing a lot of increases and to build their number and to send it in. So um, we also have heating and electrical costs estimated. David went across and met with Leah the other day and looked at what they're trying to establish in terms of the general expectation for, um, oh, we did heating. They do yeah. electrical. So for, about that. Yeah, so for electric, um, an initial estimate to increase based on um, some of Leah's discussions with, with their provider that were a collaborative of is around 30% increase on on the on the electricity um and then for the for the heat um we work with power options and um about two months ago i locked that in very similar to how i describe it or it feels very much almost like the stock market uh <laughs> do you buy high buy yeah. low right. you know do you sell um <laughs> i locked in our heat at a certain rate which is approximately 15 percent of an increase, so it's okay. But then again, um, with the thirty percent on the electric, the fifteen percent on the heat, and th then any strategic increases Bob and Bob and Kelly have made to the budget, um, that's the bottom indicator that the facilities budget is likely to go up by twenty or thirty percent, which could be approximately if it's on thirty percent side, it would be six hundred. And that's a first pass on conversation. I mean, Leah wanted to make sure that she was checking in on what we were seeing in trends and numbers as Bob and Kelly were making calculations, and um, it was a first pass conversation, and our numbers matched up similarly that we anticipated in looking at the market that it was going to be between twenty and thirty percent. So she's going to be bringing a discussion to selectmen. They're going to be looking at that, and they're going to need to lock into so they're gonna that that isn't done yet but they're trying to do the same things which is kind of estimate numbers and give us some targets and they wanted to check in on reasonableness with us around what we were finding and bob and kelly had carried almost the identical percentage doing the research they did so you know those when you look at that you're looking at about six hundred and thirty five thousand as the base number that came in from maintenance when they gave us their budget just now so that's a starting number. We're calling all of these big chunks out. And then what we do is we go back and we work it into a proposal for the overall budget. And you know we always begin by showing you all the big numbers. And then next week, you'll see how we're starting to massage those into what we think a completed kind of proposal would look like. 
So the last piece is requests, which is where all the departments come in and make their requests. So uh, a few weeks prior, I sent a email through our WLT meetings, uh, uh, basically telling everybody it's budget season, here we go. And like as you can imagine, the Westboro uh, leadership is very much on board and works collaboratively with us. Um, and we asked them to identify two groups, potential FTE increases um, and, you know, what that means and, you know, a little bit of an explanation supported with data, so on and so forth. And then also uh, requests, requests to the O&M, the level funded service line items that you saw on the previous slide. Um, to this point, we've only received um, three, well, likely done. Yeah, they're um, done. <laughs> we uh, received three requests for uh, FTE requests, um, which are the three that are listed up here. The athletic trainer, I can speak to a little more in depth just because it's from last year. Um, one of the proposals was to basically some money to basically try to partner with someone to have a, an additional athletic trainer. It, it ended up being a dead end, um, you know, part of my use of that term. But uh, we were unable to basically partner with anybody to find either a collaborative or an organization that would allow us to get specific um, resources from an individual during certain seasons. So um, as you can imagine, both Johanna and um, Eric yep. are, 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 you know, stretched very thin. So um, their request, that request is specifically from Johanna to essentially be able to post thinking that she probably has a better inkling of trying to um, mm -hmm. get a full-time person, you know, offer it and sell it as a benefits package, but also part of the Westboro family that, um, that was her initial request. The other thing is when we made that request, MIAA shifted their guidelines requiring a trainer to travel with the teams. So you, so you can't do it's impossible. They basically impossible. set up an impossible structure when most places, if they even have a trainer, they have one. And so when you have a travel team, they're requesting that they have to travel with the team. So you've set up a structure where the requirements and hopes of, and even now, you know, we'll have a game over at Gibbons or we'll have a game yeah. up on the upper field and the lower field and Eric's trying to be on site. Or, for example, a girl from volleyball came out to get taped at the football game yeah. because Eric can't be in two places. So someone will run a kid out in the, you know, in the gator and he'll <laughs> work with them in the football field and they take them back into volleyball. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do an amazing job. When you have hundreds of kids playing and the sports seasons are busy and then you layer in a requirement of travel. So we're looking to leverage that. This was, you know, something we approved having her start looking at last year. Um, the other one, the elementary nurse, I mean, we currently have a nurse that we have on a grant that, that allowed us to have additional um, staffing where we were able to then increase the staffing balance between the high school and Mill Pond, our two largest buildings that are very, very busy. Um, it shows the position at Armstrong, but it's because because we picked up a nurse in a grant, we, we put two at Mill Pond and the, the space at Armstrong is then the position that would be open if we maintain a nurse. Um, again, these are these are proposals, and then you know when we come back to you, we try to find other leverage sources. If we approve them, we say if we're going to do this, can we put it on a grant? Can we you know we can pay the athletics association trainer out of student activity funds? Like we work proportionally to use all of our offsets. We're showing you where we always start, which is what are our requests. The fails reading position, its only direct funding source would be salary. Um, but you see these are the requests and they would like to raise by 0.3 another day. They have a part-time reading specialist and they're looking to increase it. She's actually made that request several years. And then when you look at um, the O&M budget, these are requests that people put in for program needs. So you see, um, again, uh, looking to do the equity-based expansion. We currently program with athletics for hockey, for girls hockey, we are partnering with Shrewsbury. The two programs have grown size-wise where we actually can sustain our own team. We have girls that wanna come out from Gibbons that are willing to, we'd rather like have a, like a JV1, you know, joint team that we can develop in-house and, Shrewsbury's program's gotten big enough that they might not be able to host us and we don't want to get stuck where we have girls um, that don't have a program to skate in. So we're looking to expand that program. Um, again, you also see the STARS program, one of our um, really 
um, support programs at the high school, just one of the layers of program we provide. They need some furniture. Um, high school fine arts, they need a grand piano. District-wide, um, this is John's, uh, you wanna talk about Yeah, so I uh, had an opportunity to be senior spoke to, uh, to speak with John uh, Green, our technology uh, aficionado. Um, <laughs> not, on, not only with IT, but just with budgets. John is, is precise in particular. Um, that I can't give him enough credit. John basically mentioned this to uh, why he added it to his wish list was because um, there's an opportunity with our current uh, provider or contract provider that does our Wi-Fi service that John feels like that they are not being treated or prioritized. And they're having a lot of customer service issues. Um, there's an opportunity based on the, the agreement that they have that they could actually get out and partner with another company that comes heavily recommended and John has kind of done his diligence on. So this would be not only the opportunity to switch, but the opportunity to upgrade as well. So it, 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 again, John can articulate it better, but it was described almost to I mean, precision as, as, a, as a great lead. Which company from oh, to which company? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm I don't not wanna, sure the specifics. Yeah. I can get you yeah. the you can talk with John about it. I just don't want to hold a company out in public. <laughs> but, anyway, um, but structurally, um, you know, it's it's the uh, circulatory system of our whole district that strong Wi-Fi is. We all know what we think about Wi-Fi. The minute it isn't working well for you, you're squawking. So you can imagine running a district of 4,000 students and 700 teachers that when the Wi-Fi is not seamless, um, it brings us a lot of problems. Um, we have a really high quality of service, so um, we need to maintain it. So that's the 100000 that he's uh, proposing. Um, and the, uh, Daniel, why don't you pick up your two there? Sure. Um, so the, uh, there's a online textbook that uh, is it's a six-year contract for our science program in the grade seven and eight. So that's coming due um, and so that's like a, they do this thing with their online licensing where if you buy it for a year they jack up the price and if you get it for six years they give you like you know a substantial redu reduction so um, and then the phonics curriculum that we have now is a new program that we put in place um, the consumables are a reality um, and every year our kiddos in grades K through three need these booklets for writing and reading from for the phonics program. Um, and it's a, a cost that we didn't have in the past. So we adopted the new phonics program last year was the first year and I subsumed it into my budget without, you know, paying without any requests. He's to the a school stiff committee. negotiator. <laughs> he definitely gets us good pricing. Um, so those are, when you look at those benchmarks, those two sheets capture the majority of the requests that have come in um, and they will guide, um, you know, where we go from here. So um, this is the trajectory of budgeting we do every year. I think you always find the numbers staggering when you see them mount up when we bring you the first presentation. I think you've learned to like, you know, like manage expectations um, and to wait for us to then, and this is the transparency process that we've always worked towards. You have asked to see all requests. It would be wrong if I cut something and you never saw it you might make a different decision. So over the years, I might, as a trajectory of you know my perspective, come in with a certain budget where I make priority decisions, working with the leadership, and you would make another. And so over the years, we've refined a process where we hang everything out there in terms of all the total requests, all the total numbers. I haven't even gone back in and worked with, with Dave to prioritize this list with the um, admin team yet. We just ask them to assess where they are and to give us those recommendations. I think everything that's on the list has merit to be in front of you and we'll take a look at you know what that means in terms of moving forward. Um, the, the thing that's unique about the budget that you're seeing in front of you is there's you know, I mean, I did my own rough math. Steve always does this for us, but you look at the total number of dollars that were flashed before your eyes, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It was like $1.9 million of increased O&M costs, maintenance costs, service delivery costs, 
all of that and then a chunk of that request, you're looking at 3.2% roughly in all the things you just saw tonight. That's to maintain operations of our electrical, our utilities, our out of district placements, and then you have a chunk that's request, the requests are 300,000. I mean, there's a chunk in there and that's worthy finances, but it's not 1.9 million. Um, if, the thing that's different about this budget is that in the years where you're seeing those large numbers for us, you were gaining people, you were gaining programs, you were gaining new fields, you were getting things. The complexity that, that we're gonna face is that these are operational costs and we're gonna have to make our best estimates around how tightly we're gonna play the game of what is doable. It bit us around you know, what happened with special ed costs and so we're gonna be conservative in our, our calculations to cover ourselves. Um, I don't think, you know, certainly with the electrical and things we have lock-ins, so those prices are hard um, and we'll roll those numbers in front of you. So um, I'm not at a place of panic. I just wanna say, I just feel like over the years the budget is what it is to operate a district and so we're gonna present those numbers. Um, Dave is frantically working at a level which is, you know, constant given how fast we budget. He's worked as far ahead as he can. He's scrubbing the salary number. He's looking at the rollover of steps and lanes. It, he makes an assumption that all staff we have move forward. He pulls out the retirements. He puts in a base FTE um, and looks at that. We do, we do masters step two you know, and you hold that as your base number for any new hires based upon the rotation out of any retirements. The complexity of rolling that salary number is where he is right now. Yep. Um, he rolls the number for all of the extras in the contract in terms of enhancements, which are stipends and curricular work guaranteed and summer work days. All of those move forward in that salary number. Um, so he's doing all of that now. And then we start looking at how it all rolls together into base increase. Um, so between now and we're both a little panicked next, that next, it's next week. Next Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. next between Wednesday. now and next Wednesday, um, I just you know I say that not to be overly humorous about it, but to just you're very patient with recognizing that there's fluidity in even these presentations because we're moving numbers as quickly as possible. And we're presenting them to you, um, you know, through a whole month ahead of when other people give you their budgets. So we have to take this number to Christy and she rolls it into her number, but she's got a couple more weeks to work before then while she's waiting for all those numbers to come in. Like we're moving as fast as possible with one of the most substantial budgets in the town. So, you know, we're, we're um, making good headway. Um, and I think next week we'll dig in. Um, and I guess I would open it up to any questions. We've staggered. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think a big part is next week's. Yeah, it is. I think really when you, you can't see this by itself. I mean, no. this is one piece. You can't even start to think about it until you see the other because it's 83%. I mean, right. That's why. Yeah, I think that's why. Is that why there are no questions? Because, um, yeah, but statistically over the years, if you look at it, when when you roll that eighty three percent against your budget, and that's like you have to do that. It's not optional. We've been hacking away at the other twenty percent of the budget, which is a very small number. It's still big numbers, but it's a small percentage to work with. And now you see the repercussion of that against inflation and these increasing costs, you know, means we've got to add some stuff back into that base. Um, you know, otherwise you're, you're, you can't have like sump pumps give out and not have enough maintenance coverage and stuff like that. So I think we're gonna come in as conservatively as possible, but I wanted to show you those numbers as, as we work it through. I guess the shock remains to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> what this is gonna be. Yeah. I think all of us personally are, are Subject to increased fuel costs, increased service costs, increased everything. Uh, and obviously that was a major discussion by many candidates uh, in the midterm elections as well. The bottom line, however, is that there is a school system that needs to be funded, uh, providing the service to the town. Townspeople, unfortunately, are not only going to be hit for this increase, 
but also the, the increase based on higher evaluations on the, on the resident side uh, compounded now uh, by all the things we just talked about. So, I mean, obviously, as I said, uh, I, I know that the number is going to be large. And uh, I guess other than that, wait and see as to how it's structured and what we can do with it. But clearly, for every budget in the town, it's going to be painful. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. So uh, I'm going to move us on to the, and mention that the next regular session meeting of the school committee is scheduled for one week from tonight, Wednesday, November 16th, 2022. And now we're going to looking for a motion to move into executive session. Um, I guess Kristen has the correct. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's not as simple as a so move. <laughs> I make a motion to meet in executive session pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, teachers union, and administrators union, and under Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A7, to review and approve executive session minutes from October 6, 2022. Second. Um, I declare that an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the board's bargaining negotiating positions. This meeting will not reconvene in an open session. Do I, I have a roll call vote? Bachelor, yes. Uh, Vincent, yes. Edinburgh, yes. Nandan, yes. Durant, yes. And so we move into executive session. I invite everyone to now exit the room unless you have been invited to attend this executive session. And I forgot to thank Amber and Dave and Daniel for your, your presentations tonight. It was really quite thorough. I appreciate it. I know that we're sort of getting tired, but um, that does not mean we do not appreciate what you've done. So thank you. We're exercising our meeting stamina. When you skip a meeting, you know. Bye, John. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Right, Trika, you get to go home.